Hey y'all, Scott here. Remember when you were six? Bet you remember doing some pretty off the wall stuff. Learning to ride a bike, slumber parties, releasing the worst stupid ass Mario Strikers Battle League you could release, puppet shows. The Nintendo Switch is only 26 years away from being 32. I think you know the drill by now. It's time for a look at everything revolving around this console from March 2022 to February 2023. And if you know me, you know I have my own funny little made up language where the word everything stands for Nintendo Switch Sports and very little else. March was when words became title with the release of Triangle Strategy, the latest HD 2D game by Square Enix, though published by Nintendo outside of Japan. So while I generally don't play a ton of turn-based strategy games, Kirby and the Forgotten Land! The first 3D mainline Kirby game launched this month, and it was incredible. They went above and beyond with this title. You can feel the passion and polish oozing from this thing every second you're playing it. I think it's incredible how, with this being the first 3D Kirby, it doesn't feel like it. This is so natural and well done. You'd think Kirby's been 3D this whole damn time. And Forgotten Land could have just coasted along on that gimmick alone. And they could have made this a pretty generic Kirby theme wise due to this being such a new direction for the franchise. But they introduced so many new concepts and gameplay mechanics that by themselves would have warranted this being a new game, even if it was still just 2D Kirby. But no, it just all adds together to make this one of the best Kirby games of all time, which is something Triangle Strategy could never be. All right, so this is a good game, but from my experience, it's only really going to appeal to those who look at it and finger wiggle. If you love classic tactical RPGs, emphasis on classic, emphasis on ass, this is for you. For me, I found the pacing to be ridiculously slow. I mean, like the first six hours, you only get into like two battles, and while the gameplay works well, it doesn't entice me enough to warrant crawling through a cutscene for over an hour. This is a quality game that knows its audience and doesn't try to be something it isn't, which, while making making it a hard pill to swallow for newcomers is a dream come true for retro tactical RPG fans. And for myself, as far as hard pills go, this was a choking hazard. Obviously Forgotten Land was more my speed this month. I just can't get over how well they knocked this one out of the park. Even things that would be easy to criticize, I, I just can't. Enemies in the background run at a choppy frame rate, but I find that charming, if anything. Evolving abilities, mouthful mode, offering a large variety of gameplay scenarios throughout the stages, the surprisingly challenging and addicting Treasure Road side missions, the Waddle Dee Town Hub World, the gorgeous visuals, phenomenal soundtrack. Kirby in the Forgotten Land is amazing, and for somebody who's been wanting a 3D Kirby for as long as they can remember, it exceeded my expectations. My expectations were this, but still. With those two titles, it was definitely a busy month for Nintendo. But yeah, the first wave of the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass DLC on top of it, and it becomes damn near still pretty manageable, but that's a lot of stuff. Yes, announced during the February 2022 Nintendo Direct and releasing on March 18th, Wave 1 of the Booster Course Pass was met with a police report. And while a lot of issues were evident from the initial trailer, they all kind of sunk in when the DLC finally released. These tracks were not at the same quality as those from the base game. What Nintendo seemed to do was repurpose many of the assets from Mario Kart Tour on mobile for these tracks, which meant a whole lot of... This is a little shitty. And none of the first eight tracks released are bad. It's just in comparison to what we've gotten from Mario Kart 8 before, a good handful of these are just plainfully bland layout-wise, and due to the more simple visuals, feel somewhat empty and soulless. Toad Circuit from 3DS is so basic to race on, and graphically does the bare minimum. The grass is completely flat with no texture. The trees and rocks are so choppy looking compared to previous Mario Kart 8 tracks, and the only bits of detail on this course we're ripped from those Mario Kart 8 tracks. Now, this isn't the case with all of Wave 1. Paris Promenade from Mario Kart Tour has a better look to it and far more detail, though still not up to snuff with the base game. But it does something cool since most original Mario Kart Tour tracks are a bit shorter, plus have multiple variants. They made this one change its layout with every lap, which I think was a great idea to incorporate those variants and help make these courses stand out so much more. Like Tokyo Blur from Mario Kart Tour. Everybody loves Tokyo Blur from Mario Kart Tour. Quick, name your favorite thing about Tokyo Blur from Mario Kart Tour. Well, oh, just the massive amounts of Tokyo Blur energy I get from it. Ninja Hideaway from Tour is a great inclusion. It's one of the few tracks from that game that's 
really damn special. Though its layout strangely doesn't feel as refined as other courses, it honestly feels more like a custom track a fan would make for Mario Kart Wii than an official one, uh, but it's still quite good. Shroom Ridge DS is good, albeit bland visually. Uh, Coconut Mall Wii is a fantastic inclusion and has a solid enough visual style that it makes the lower end graphics less noticeable. Uh, same with Chaco Mountain N64. Though Sky Garden GBA, my lord! What a nothing track this is! Uh, we already have a great cloud-based course in the game. We have great Game Boy Advance remakes in the game. This is neither. At the very least, the music is phenomenal across all the DLC. The visuals may have taken a hit, but the soundtrack quality remained. The wave one was a pretty mixed bag overall. It's great to have more Mario Kart 8 content, and even if the tracks are lacking overall, the worst Mario Kart course is better than most kart racers best. It's just half of these feel like filler. They didn't really make a ton of changes to the non-tour tracks. In fact, none of Wave 1 incorporated Mario Kart 8's main gimmick, Anti-Gravity, which helped make the returning tracks in the base game feel so fresh. And the only upgrades they did make to these courses were present in their Mario Kart Tour versions, which just really hit home that these are basically mobile game tracks polished up a bit to fit in Mario Kart 8. Which, yeah, you gotta admit, can be kind of deflating. But at the same time, I'd rather get these tracks than not get them at all. It's really smart of Nintendo to reuse assets like this because it's effective. It's something in demand. We've all wanted more Mario Kart content and eventually, since Mario Kart Tour requires online to play, all that work they did to remaster tracks and make new ones will all go offline. And whenever Mario Kart Tour content was announced, everybody would go, man, why isn't this in Mario Kart 8? So they put him in here. It's probably being done by a younger development team as a training wheels project to learn track design for future Mario Kart titles. It adds value to the Nintendo Switch Online expansion pack subscription since it's included here. It just makes all the sense in the world. And while I wish these courses were the same quality as the others, they're still good tracks at the very least, even if they can be forgettable and kind of boring sometimes. But if me getting more Mario Kart content means Toad Circuit 3DS has to be Toad Circuit 3DS, I mean, I am in hell, but man, there's a nice old sucker down here. Speaking of kart racers, Square Enix released Chocobo GP this month. Still here. All we have here is a decent Final Fantasy kart racing spinoff and sequel to the PS1 game Chocobo Racing from 1999. I could have sworn there were more of these. GP looks and plays pretty well, though it's really hard for me to recommend it because it's literally just a less polished, less good, and less fun Mario Kart. And when you're priced at 50 bones, I just start to ask questions. Especially when there's such aggressive microtransactions baked into the experience. I mean, is there any reason for a $50 release to have me spend money on it like this? Well, yeah, but the game isn't calling me cute. Persona 4 Arena Ultimax, a fighting game spinoff of Persona 4 from 2014 got a re-release on Switch because what better way to follow up a fighting game that's not on Switch that was a follow-up to an RPG that's not on Switch which followed up the entire backlog of Persona games that aren't on Switch that was later followed up by Persona 5 which is not on Switch which got a follow-up hack and slash on Switch then with a fighting game on Switch. Damn, you got me. And at long last, Rune Factory 5 launched this month. Remember when this was announced during a Nintendo Direct in February of 2019? Neither do I. Well, three years later, it's finally here. Moving on. When it comes to news, the biggest story of March easily was the delay of Breath of the Wild 2. While it was announced to be coming this year, Nintendo released a video explaining how they needed just a bit more time to make the game something special, promising a revised spring 2023 release date. With this delay, Breath of the Wild 2 will have taken longer from announcement to launch than the original Breath of the Wild, which is insane. Of course, real world events definitely did a number to the title's production, but I mean, regardless, they have barely shown any reason as to why this game is taking so long. It's reusing assets. Hell, the map is the same as the first one. Well, I think it's all part of Nintendo's little marketing game. You know, one of the things that made the original Breath of the Wild so special was how much there was to discover on your own. It brought back so many to the playground trading secrets. Please not literally. And the fact that everybody is already sold on Breath of the Wild 2 due to the mere fact it's 
Breath of the Wild 2 means Nintendo's obviously holding back a ton about this game to keep that element of surprise, especially when you first start playing. Which is not why they also delayed Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp this month. Originally meant to release in December of 2021, getting delayed to April, and getting further delayed to an unspecified day due to real world events clashing with the theming of the game, which is unprecedented for the Advance Wars series. Oh, well at least the Nintendo Switch's system software got some love this month. You ever notice Anarchy's been at an all-time low since March 21st? Yeah, it looks a little better. Well, that's because Nintendo finally added folders to the Switch home screen, or more accurately, groups. Don't want to step on Mead's toes. Yeah, so the only way to access these is by going to your full game library and selecting the groups option at the top, which makes this feature a bit less useful than it could have been. It does help with organizing certain types of software, but why couldn't it have been on the main home screen? I mean, you put this slow-ass Nintendo Switch Online portal on there that had no point until this month, actually, where you can now exchange your My Nintendo Platinum points for exclusive Switch user icons. Why are you still depressed? Big month for Nintendo Switch Sports bitchers out there. You finally have something to bitch about. Nintendo Switch Sports Release, the long-awaited follow-up to the Wii series. My god, it felt like for the longest time Nintendo was trying their damnedest to do anything but something with this branding again. Then publishing games like Go Vacation, Fitness Boxing, and developing ones like Ring Fit Adventure and Clubhouse Games proved to me that throughout the whole Switch generation, Nintendo's been gritting their teeth. They've wanted to do these casual games, but we're probably worried after the Wii U's failure that this style of branding just didn't equate to sales anymore. Turned out, it did. You just had to know how to sell it. Switch Sports does what it sets out to do. It's a Wii Sports game on Nintendo Switch, but it doesn't go any further than that. And while it has a solid presentation and the controls work well, its lack of ambition, genuine replay value, character, new ideas, coherent direction, damn, I might not like this game, makes it hard to consider this anything more than just okay. Six sports are included. A huge step up from Wii Sports 5 and Wii Sports Resorts 12 if you count negatives. Half of the sports are brought back from previous games, bowling, tennis, and chambra, which was sword play and resort, but I gotta hand it to Nintendo. The controls work really, really well here. They pretty much operate as they did back on the Wii, which is great since the Joy-Con motion controls, even if they can be more precise, I find to be more consistently finicky compared to the Wii remote. I mean, bowling in Clubhouse games was okay, but definitely had its issues, whereas in Nintendo Switch Sports, things just feel right. This is some of the best feeling motion control on the system, though the Joy-Con small size definitely makes some of these sports feel a bit more awkward to play than on the Wii. But hey, that's where the new sports come in. We got badminton. Oh, oh, boo. When I said this game lacks a coherent direction, this is what I mean. What is up with this lineup of sports? The three new ones either feel like variations of sports already in the game or something that doesn't feel like Wii Sports. Badman should just be a sub game you select when you pick tennis. They're too damn similar for this to be one of the only six sports available. And volleyball, while well, I'm way more open to its inclusion, the fact that it's played on a very similar court makes Nintendo Switch Sports visually feel incredibly repetitive. But hey, at least we have the final new inclusion, soccer, where you move with the left stick, jump with the B button, dash with ZL when you have stamina, swing both controllers down to do a header, swing while holding ZR down to pass to a teammate, swing just one in a direction to kick the ball there. Grandpa can't do this. Soccer, while it's a fun little inclusion, does not feel like it belongs in a Wii Sports game. Don't get me wrong, it's not complicated. It's complicated for Wii Sports. This feels more at home as a Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games mini game, and even as that, it's kind of fun, but it's pretty much just a way slower Rocket League. Your stamina takes way too long to fill up after using it. There's only one field to play on. I find this sport to not really please anybody. It's too complicated for casual players, yet too simple and slow for the core ones. Not bad, but feels out of place in the package to me, which is kind of the basis of my problem with this game. It's a bit cobbled together. A bunch of different ideas that don't necessarily create a product with a clear direction. Included with the physical copy is the leg strap. What can you use it for? Funny mustache. At launch, this was only used in this one practice minigame mode in soccer where you're just shooting balls into the goal. You had to wait until July for an update that enables use of the leg strap in the regular soccer matches. But you know what they say, good things come to those who wait. And it's July. 
Why even include this with every copy of the game at that point? It just seems really wasteful. Is it just because other Wii Sports games were bundles of some sort, so you just threw this in to make it more of a deal? But this is the same damn leg strap included with Ring Fit Adventure. They didn't have to do anything to include this. No research and development, no manufacturing costs, no nothing. So at that point, if you're including this, why not pick sports that would actually use it? Instead of Badman, why not include kickball, track and field events like the long jump, American football, just anything that could actually make use of this thing. Because as it stands, it was obviously included just to give this game more of a presence on store shelves. Oh my god, big box? Big no regret! Oh man, you know what would have given this game just as much of a presence as past Wii Sports titles? If it looked like a goddamn Wii Sports title. These characters, man, they just don't. Do it for me! Yes, you can use your me in the game, but it's very clear Nintendo Switch Sports is built around these new sports mates. They're all over the branding, they're the characters populating the world, all the unlockables are based around them. And let me tell you, as characters, they're fine, whatever. As avatars, they are God awful! Everybody looks the same! You can't change height or weight, all the eye types are too similar, the hair options are unbelievably limiting. But that's only because more options are locked behind progression. What the hell kind of sense does that make? Make funny hats unlockable? Sure. Eye options though? And you can only unlock these by playing online over and over and over again. That's pretty much this game's only hook. There's nothing you get from playing single player or local multiplayer. It's all based around the online mode, which is crazy considering how one of Wii Sports biggest problems back in the day was the lack of online multiplayer. Now it's the main focus and it's kinda lame. Being a big focus and being here at all is great, but that's all this game is about and it's not deep. It's literally just keep playing online to get more points, to get more customization for your sports mate. Which, th this doesn't incentivize me to keep playing. I have to trudge through hours of gameplay just to get some damn glasses to wear? Why couldn't there be a simple achievement system where it doesn't matter if you're playing online or locally, you get rewarded medals for high scores or your points could unlock sub modes for the sports like 100 pin bowling or speed slice for Chambara. I don't care if there's a thousand different cosmetics I can nab by playing online because after like two hours, I've already seen everything substantial there is to do in this game. That's not to say it isn't fun to keep playing in multiplayer, but I'd say local is where it's at due to just being able to talk, hang out with the other players in person. The online works well, but it wasn't designed with a deep enough loop to keep me engaged. And that's a problem when you promise content coming to the game that takes months to release. I don't care by the time it's actually out. So the soccer leg strap update took three months to launch, but Nintendo also promised golf in the game for release in the fall. Seven months later! Why did this take so long to come out? None of the holes are even new designs. This sport has been in every Wii Sports game at launch. I don't understand. Don't get me wrong. I think this is an all right game and it can be good fun, but I just don't think it's deep enough to warrant ripping out any side modes or single player endeavors to make online the focus which is what tons of Nintendo's multiplayer games are doing nowadays. It's like you ask them, what is there to do in this game? Ah, just play online, you love this shit. These games feel designed around the idea that they don't have to prove anything to the player. The player already wants to spend 20 hours in the game playing online multiplayer, but like, no. Give me a reason to want to play for 20 hours. Hook me in, do something other than just assume including online multiplayer increases the replay value to infinity because it doesn't. Decent enough game, though it does feel feel pretty cobbled together with the light amount of content, the updates coming months later, and the overall lack of ambition. It feels like just a Wii Sports type game on Switch and nothing more. But for what it is, I think it's still a pretty quality title that you can get some good fun out of. I hate this game, but for what it is, I like it. Big month for third party games here, we got the House of the Dead remake. Wow, that's so exciting. It would be even more exciting if I gave a damn. So there's this company called Forever Entertainment and they seem to be making deals with numerous game studios to bring back some of their titles and mostly ones they didn't really care about anymore. They released a remake of Panzer Dragoon by Sega, announced Front Mission 1 and 2 by Square in the February Nintendo Direct. Hell, Nintendo themselves invested in them, announcing a partnership, most likely leading to some of their own games getting Forever Entertainmented. There's obviously something special about this studio. 
obviously. I think they're getting so much work because they'll fund the games, they'll publish the games, they'll do everything and anything. All they need is permission. So for a company like Sega, who already wasn't doing anything with House of the Dead, to get an offer where you don't gotta do anything but make money off of whatever Forever Entertainment puts out, I mean, why the hell not? It's either this or nothing. This is nothing, right? Man, I don't know about this one. House of the Dead is a downright classic from the arcades. However, take it out of the arcades, and while you're at it, take away the gun peripheral and the era it came out, and you're left with a 30 minute long awkward. It's not bad, it's still House of the Dead, but in this context, it's just kinda lame. The visuals are a huge step up, but I find them to not have the same character and charm as the original, and things just look a bit too generic now. The controls are definitely the biggest issue here, though. They give you very Various options. However, while I personally didn't have many functional issues with them, lacking the light gun makes the experience just kind of pathetic feeling. It's great to have this game on modern platforms, but at the cost of losing so much of what made House of the Dead special to begin with, it makes this remake more for longtime fans rather than newcomers looking to find what made this game a classic to begin with. I think it would have hit a little better if they included this in a big House of the Dead collection. And that way, like, yeah, the controls aren't great, but at least you get all of them. MLB The Show made its debut on Nintendo Switch. Which, it's still pretty wild to see a game with the PlayStation logo appear here. Star Wars The Force Unleashed got a re-release, though strangely, it's the Wii version of the game. Hey, I'm all for funky-ass versions of games getting ports, but I find this to be a bit misleading. I think most would assume this is the Xbox 360 version re-released. It's like if they announced Modern Warfare was coming to Switch. Lying's a sin but not theirs. Definitely when it came to Star Wars this month, Lego Star Wars The Skywalker Saga was the main attraction, which was a huge shakeup for the Lego series, uh, really modernizing the whole thing. This title took way longer to develop than the other games, and you can immediately tell why. They went above and beyond to not only push the Lego games forward, but celebrate their most popular franchise and its Lego legacy as well. Chrono Cross, the Radical Dreamers Edition. This was another one of those games that just refused to re-release for years, finally getting a well-deserved remaster. If this is the remaster, I don't wanna know what the original game was. Yeah, this launched in rough shape. Like, how is this running so poorly? It's an RPG from the PlayStation 1. Like, did it have to release this month? Couldn't it have waited till May? No. Bug Snacks, 13 Sentinels, The Stanley Parable, Ultra Deluxe, tons of stuff to fiddle around with this month. And that's not even counting any DLC, like the free update to Metroid Dread adding a boss rush, and Splatoon 2's Octo expansion getting added into the Nintendo Switch Online expansion pack for subscribers. I like this practice. Seems that Nintendo's putting some of their in-house developed DLC into the expansion pack, which I would like to see more of. It's a great way to get customers more invested in certain titles and franchises. I mean, I can tell why they did this, because Splatoon 3's release date was revealed right alongside it, September 9th. Yeah, that don't feel right. Splatoon is a summer game, man. September 9th may still be summer technically, but there's just something wrong about this. And there's something wrong about this. It's coming sooner. It seems like Xenoblade 3 and Splatoon 3 swapped internal release dates with Xenoblade originally scheduled for September now releasing in July. Sure, please, God, let, let's get this over with. Sonic Origins got a full announcement trailer and everything. A collection of Sonic 1, 2 CD and 3 and Knuckles all together in widescreen with brand new animated cutscenes. Oh, this looked magnificent. It felt like game compilations for a bit there were getting really sterile. Like, yeah, they may have been good quality, but I love how this one was going out of its way to be something more than just a collection of the classic Sonic titles. It was confusing, too. I think Sega has some kind of mandate that all their releases now have to have some kind of deluxe edition on offer, which is just kind of dumb for something like this. They locked camera control in the main menu behind the deluxe edition. What a luxury. A rumor was floating around concerning Bandai Namco and Nintendo collaborating on an HD remake of a 3D action game, which many hypothesized could be Kid Icarus Uprising or maybe Star Fox Assault, which Namco did work on back in the day, but keeping reality in mind. Oh yeah, I almost forgot! Life does f***ing stink! However, a big leak occurred with Nintendo Switch Online, as numerous NES games that were being tested for the service leaked, uh, which could lead to them being offered on the service, or maybe the developers were just using them as placeholders. Hey, you can only play Pac-Man on Nintendo Switch for the sixth time for the first time once. More notably though, emulators for Game Boy and Game Boy Advance were uncovered, showing not only they were being worked on for Nintendo Switch Online, but added credibility to another rumor that the transfer pack for Nintendo 64 would 
would be implemented into the service, which allowed you to bring elements of Game Boy games to select console titles. So everything was coming together here, but thank God all this news didn't happen in May. You know, it's nice to have a month from time to time with not a lot going on. And with May housing really only two notable releases, Pac-Man Museum Plus and KO the Kangaroo, it obviously wasn't one of those months. Pac-Man Museum Plus was definitely on my radar, as I grew up with and quite enjoy a Pac-Man or two. Though, like I just said, it's pretty ridiculous how much the original game has been re-released on Switch in some form, and considering how a good handful of games in this collection have also been re-released on Switch in some form, it just makes me question why this compilation exists in the first place or didn't go further, because there's an endless amount of other Pac-Man games that could have and should have been included. Pac-Man Championship Edition is here, but why not Championship DX? What about Pac-Man Plus, Pac-Man Versus, Mega Tunnel Battle, Pac Picks, or especially Miss Pac-Man? Well, since Miss Pac-Man has some legal rights mumbo jumbo tied to her, Bandai Namco is effectively erasing her from history. With this compilation, any mention of that creature is replaced with a new character, Pac-Mom. What's the birthing process like on that? Kinda lame they had to go into some of these games and edit them, but to be fair, these are very minor changes that really don't affect anything. While the game lineup could have been better, there's still a lot here, a lot of games that rarely get re-released, but it's like, Pack Motos? A mini game from Namco Museum Remix on the Wii? Yeah, integral to Pac-Man's history. The next game included uh, that, that one time he was next to a bee. Some of these definitely feel a bit like filler titles, while others are just downright bizarre. The Pack in Time uses the Japanese version and has subtitles pop up. Though, this game has always had an official English release. I don't know, but I'm just happy there's a stupid ass little hub to run around in. Just like I said about Sonic Origins, I love when compilations go above and beyond like this. Though I wish that effort could be felt across the whole package, there's barely any options here, which wasn't the case with Namco Museum on Switch. Lots of little mistakes when it comes to this game's attention to detail just stick out, like 3D models of the arcade cabinets just not being accurate at all. Questionable game choices and omissions, plus some noticeable input lag, really stop this collection from being anything more than just alright. For 20 bones, there's definitely more than enough here, I just wish it was all a bit more fleshed out. I don't know, maybe if they focused more on like the kangaroo side of things. KO the kangaroo, man, me and this franchise go way back, all the way back to May 2022. Yeah, this is a series I wasn't aware of before this reboot. It never seemed to be the most popular or amazing thing out there, but always cool to see something like this come back and at the quality it did. This is a well done 3D platformer. It's nothing mind blowing, but hey, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think games always have to push boundaries or be anything revolutionary all the time. It's nice to have just a solid little title that people of all ages can enjoy. And I think KO is that. I definitely recommend it for those looking around at 3D platformers. But man, you'd be mistaken if you're acting like this was all there was on Switch this month because Nintendo Switch Online received some new games. At least in the expansion pack, we got Kirby 64, which was a nice addition, plus an Indie World event happened. Another major stuck out to me here outside of Cult of the Lamb and Curse to Golf, but hey, we got some major game trailers to make up for that. Sonic Frontiers received its first gameplay teaser, showing the open world style in action, and while this initial 30 second teaser felt more like a proof of concept than a look at a full game, I was definitely intrigued by what I saw, and I was looking forward to seeing more- Ooh! But finally, we were a month out from Mario Strikers Battle League's release. And Nintendo released a trailer, a demo? Oh my god, June can't come soon enough! Cause I just wanna get this over with! You gotta hand it to June. It can't be easy to house the Antichrist release date. Mario Strikers Battle League was the long-awaited return of the series after 15 years. Finally, I can move on to another dormant franchise to beg for the return of I inevitably won't like. It's a crippling fetish. I've never been the biggest Mario Strikers nut on the planet. I respect the hell out of these games, but I ain't great at them. And strangely enough, it's hard to get super invested into something I'm completely in utter dog shit at. I may have a crippling fetish, but I know it's not masochism. However, that doesn't mean I never get invested into Strikers. I love the frantic action, the extreme and edgy style. It's super fun. I just don't think I'm good at soccer games. I'm just running around with the ball and have terrible judgment on when to pass and shoot. Because when I compare my game Played to others.
yeah, I'm at fault here. But man, it was still great to see the series return on Nintendo Switch. Though as early as the announcement trailer, something felt off. Things were a bit more sanitized. There wasn't a huge amount of new ideas or additions, and the character roster shown off was woefully lacking. Uh, but hey, that was just for the announcement. Scott, I'm you from 10 seconds in the future. That wasn't the announcement trailer. That was the full game. Oh man, I better warn past Scott. Battle League has well-designed gameplay at its core. There's quite a bit of strategy to employ on the field here, and it can go pretty deep, which I applaud them for. But I feel they could have done this while keeping things more accessible. Every time I boot this up, I need to go through the tutorial again because I'm not gonna remember all of this. The controls feel overcomplicated, and while everything's manageable and not rocket science, it does make this title a lot harder to jump back into after a while, pop in at a moment's notice, or pick up as a newcomer. And it's not like things are that much deeper now. It's not like they had this incredible new idea for the series like Mario Tennis Aces. Sure, that complicated things, but it felt warranted. This feels more balanced, strategic, and competitive compared to the previous games, but nothing was really added to get us here. If anything, they took things away. A huge lack of items to use on the field, which wasn't the case on GameCube and Wii. Stadiums with absolutely no gimmicks, no reason to pick one over the other, barely any characters, which in a 4v4 soccer game, you're gonna be seeing the same ones over and over again. No actual modes, unlockables, the personality of the series has been sanitized to oblivion. The moment to moment gameplay is enjoyable, but it gets stale incredibly quickly due to there being no variety here. This is completely what you see is what you get. So many things about this game just don't add up. Uh, like a big feature is how you combine two different stadiums together, but it's like there's barely anything aesthetically different between them and definitely nothing gameplay wise. So what's the point? All of these fields are the same with a different symbol in the middle of them. Like this is supposed to be the Luigi's Mansion Stadium? Yeah, can't you tell by the grass? All this special themed elements aren't viewable during normal gameplay and can only be seen during the cutscenes. Why? If you actually thought this out, you would use a camera angle that would show off the unique details of each stadium. But no, now every game looks the exact same. There's this whole gear element where you purchase armor to add to your character, which changes their stats. You know what else gives you different stats? Playing as a different character. If each of these guys had wildly different move sets, the gear would make a lot more sense. It would be like creating a custom character in Smash Brothers. Just because he had a lot of power to Mario doesn't make him the same as Bowser. It's just a more powerful Mario now. That's not the case here. The only differences between these characters are their stats. So using gear to change those stats just makes both elements feel pointless. There's really no modes here. The only single player option is just these tournaments. Play against CPUs. That's all it is. Battle League is heavily focused on online multiplayer. And it can't even do that right! No 4v4 online. You can only do 1v1 or 2v2. In a game designed around 4v4 that's stripped away anything and everything else to do because online is the sole focus. Look at this! I call this one f***ing up. This game feels like it's constantly contradicting itself. It has no direction, nothing to say, nothing to add onto the series. The amount of content here is comparable to that of a free demo. The animation is incredible, but you see the same clips repeated over and over again, so it loses all impact. The gameplay works well, but I don't find it better than what came prior, which also had more content in every single way. Mario Strikers Battle League isn't bad, it's unacceptable. This is yet another in the never ending line of Nintendo multiplayer focused games that launch in an incredibly lacking state that receives free updates adding more content down the line. Battle League received two new characters, a stage, and additional gear every few months until December 2022. But it's like, these additions didn't help the game whatsoever. New stages, I mean, look at this. Does this make you wanna play the game again? Well, to feel better about myself, yeah, the gear and characters make each other pointless. It's cool to see Pauline, but gee, alongside Rosalina, we're the only new additions to the series. If the free updates were nothing but new characters, that would at least be more exciting, but no, Shy Guy! Man, this game is just surprising me more and more. Why are you doing this? I understand why many really got behind Battle League, finding it to be an addictive and strategic multiplayer game. But I'm just not in that camp. I find the gameplay respectable, but nothing else really draws me to it. I need a reason to keep playing other than to keep playing. 
and this just doesn't offer that. For $60, I found this insulting, if anything. Man, the Mario sports games on Switch just keep going downhill. And that's even more evident by the next one. Fire Emblem Warriors Three Hopes, Nintendo's second published game this month. Man, I just can't win. A successor not only to the original Fire Emblem Warriors, but Three Houses as well. Uh, this is pretty much following the exact same beats as Hyrule Warriors. Big, sticky, ooey, gooey, non-canon fan fest first, followed up by a more grounded title based on a mainline game. Now, this does the same thing as Age of Calamity and is in an alternate timeline, which is just a cop out to me. You want to make a sequel without actually making a sequel. So if the story is bad, well, it didn't really happen. If the story is good, damn it, we wasted it on this. Well, that might actually not be a bad thing, considering this turned out to be one of my most played Fire Emblems. Much like how colorblindness is my most played disease. It's not for any particular reason outside of Warriors games can be mindless fun, and this is a quality one I played during a moment of weakness. I wouldn't say this is for everybody. Three Houses fans and Warriors players are for sure the ones who would get the most out of it, though it surprisingly kept my attention for a while. It's a solid hack and slash which I can't say about Sonic Origins. Man, no wonder. The big 31st birthday celebration for Sonic the Hedgehog, celebrating 10 whole years of being tried as an adult. Sonic 1, 2, CD, 3, and Knuckles all remastered and bundled together alongside a slew of bonus content. There's nothing better than this. Huh, well, there is the plague. This really has got a fair amount of criticism. It was a bit buggy. They had to replace some music tracks with far worse ones. They could have included more games, especially with such a high price point, and the extras lacked substance and attention to detail, with some of the songs in the museum being mislabeled. It's really unfortunate because this is probably the definitive official way to play these games. I mean, widescreen alone is a huge upgrade. The animated cutscenes are incredible and such a cool addition. The missions are addicting to complete. Uh, this is good overall, but kept from greatness due to all the little things adding up. Plus, it's definitely underwhelming how half of this collection has already been re-released to oblivion, and on top of that, these widescreen remasters are based on the mobile phone versions, which were amazing. There's a reason why people were begging them to come to console and PC, but at what cost, man? That cost, man! I like this compilation. It's obvious a lot of love went into it, and it's great to have classic Sonic and widescreen on something the neighbors can see. Though, it's obvious things were mishandled by Sega here, and while this could have been way worse, it definitely deserved to be a whole lot better. I think my main hang up is the lack of other games included. I think could have added Vampire Hunter 2 Darkstalkers Revenge, Night Warriors Darkstalkers Revenge, that Sonic Spinball. Well, the Capcom Fighting Collection is two for three on those. Oh. A compilation of various Capcom fighting games in the same style as their beat em up bundle they did way back in 2018. This is mostly focused on the Darkstalker series, with a few stragglers thrown in there, like Hyper Street Fighter 2 and Cyberbots. But see, this is the exact opposite of Sonic Origins. I mean, the quality here is sublime, but check out the presentation of the compilation itself. Ew, boring. Sonic Origins, on the other hand, has character animation on the main menu. And all it cost was my integrity and mirror. On the topic of bundles, we got the Portal Companion Collection this month, Portal and Portal 2 on the Nintendo Switch. I remember back in 2017 when it was announced the Portal series was making its Nintendo Switch debut. Well, we finally got the actual titles on here. Uh, surprisingly, before any other modern console, it turns out this was because Nvidia originally developed this for the Nvidia Shield, which basically uses the same processor as a Switch, so I guess they thought, why not? But they should ask that more often with games by Valve. It's very rare to see anything they make these days leave the PC realm, which is a crime. Portal 1 and Portal 2 are some of the greatest games of all time, and these Switch versions are damn near flawless. So yeah, a complete must buy here, especially if you never played either one of these before. But what does that mean for Rabbids Party of Legends? It's surprisingly been quite a long time since the last traditional Rabbids Party game on consoles, the genre the franchise is best known for, and nearly 10 years since one. Uh, sure, we've gotten mobile games and Mario plus Rabbids, but man, it feels so nice to not give a f about Rabbids again. This release is unique as it was originally designed and released exclusively for China, which is the basis for the game's theme. And while this is still a pretty quality little party game, you can definitely sniff out the fact this was developed with the intention of only being available in a very specific region. 
many of the mini games are ripped from previous Rabbids titles. The cutscenes were obviously made on the cheap, and this is pretty damn similar to how other China exclusive games from well known series work. However, for what it is, Rabbids Party of Legends actually ain't half bad. It looks decent, the mini games are all fast paced and fairly enjoyable, the theming is pretty cool, the tutorials are quick and understandable, the controls work fine. I'd say this is one of the better Wii style party games on Switch. So, to answer the question, it may be no portal, but portal ain't no Rabbids Party of Legends. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge. This was a big deal for 40 year olds everywhere. A spiritual successor to the Konami beat-em-ups, Shredder's Revenge is created with the same kind of love as Sonic Mania, Wonder Boy the Dragon's Trap, Streets of Rage 4. Regardless of if you're a fan of the source material or not, this is an expertly crafted experience that I think anybody can appreciate as, honestly, one of the best beat-em-ups ever made. This is a real gem right here, and thankfully the Switch release got the recognition it deserved. Like Fall Guys, the recognition it deserved. <laughs> Listen man, you gotta strike when the iron's hot, and with the initial release occurring in the summer of 2020, the Switch port being announced in early 2021, and now finally releasing in June of 2022, is it really surprising how little everybody talked about this? It runs, that's Fall Guys on Switch. It's a fun online multiplayer game, and now that it's gone free to play, you have absolutely no excuse to not give it a try, none. And June was, packed with junk to play, and I just scratched the surface. Because in addition to numerous games, we got DLC like Cuphead and the Delicious Last Course and Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. The Cuphead DLC took so damn long to come out, man. I'll probably play that at a later point. It just wasn't a huge priority for me, though I respect the hell out of these developers for sticking with it. When the DLC itself takes like four years to come out, I would have just converted it to a full-blown sequel at that point, which would have gotten more press and probably sales, but hey, I gotta commend them for pulling through and finally releasing what seems to be an excellent expansion. Now, Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak? Do you wonder what Scott has to say about DLC to a game he only played two hours of? I do too, because he says nothing. Now, June is normally the month reserved for a no holds barred, all you can bitch buffet. E3 season, there's nothing like it, which yeah, that's what it was like this year, nothing. With no E3 event occurring, not even a digital one like in 2021, and Nintendo didn't hold a normal Nintendo Direct, instead opting for a Nintendo Direct mini partner showcase on June 28th. Man, how about instead of this nice juicy steak, you'd you, you just fucking shoot me. The Nintendo Direct Mini Partner Showcase feels like a presentation Nintendo does out of obligation. They have to advertise their third party games, but they don't have enough of their own content to warrant a regular Nintendo Direct. That's not saying they didn't have games for the rest of the year, but what did you have to say about them? Did we really need a new Splatoon 3 trailer in June when you could just wait until we're closer to launch? Without E3, I don't think Nintendo felt they had any reason to hold a normal Nintendo Direct this month. So in came a mini partner showcase. Uh, these are pretty hit or miss. Ever since their debut in 2020, they're either pretty damn tolerable or showcasing WWE Battlegrounds. It's either one or the other. And this one falls into the everybody needs competition, even God category. Holy smokes, this was packed! Near Automata on Nintendo Switch. Never thought I'd see the day. This is one of those dream Nintendo Switch ports that just didn't happen. And by 2022, I thought if it was ever coming, they would wait until the next system. But lo and behold, Old, it exists and at a far higher quality than I ever expected to see on Switch. I was expecting like th the color green to make the transition. Super Bomberman R2, that's a surprise, but definitely a welcome one. Great to see them keep the series alive, though I'm worried they put this into production due to the strong sales of the original, which were no doubt due to being a Switch launch title. How well would the same kind of game do six years later without the luxury of being one of the only damn things you could do with your system? I don't know, but hey, that wasn't the only old school face we saw here. The Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection, Return to Monkey Island, Dragon Quest Treasures, Pac-Man World Repack? A remake of the PS1 game? Oh, you bet your pack ass a remake of the PS1 game. This is one of those things I never expect to see again outside of a compilation of just emulated ROMs like a Pac-Man Museum type deal. 
It's a game that just isn't discussed a ton outside of the community who grew up with it, which puts it in this awkward middle ground between the arcade classics and abominations toward mankind, which led a lot of people to think this was a game that just sort of happened. Oh, everybody had to try a 3D platformer, so Pac-Man did too. Who gives a damn? So man, is it cool to see a game like this get some time to shine. Because while it's really nothing special, the Pac-Man world always deserved more respect, and it finally looks like it got it. We got our first look at Switch footage of Sonic Frontiers. Wow, I am sorry you had to hear me say that. that I apologize. Sega opened the floodgates on Frontiers footage this month. Trailers, gameplay footage, it all looked very concerning. Not necessarily bad outside of the obscene graphical pop-in, but just very directionless. It seemed as if they just took a bunch of things in modern open world games and threw Sonic in them without any rhyme or reason. It wasn't apparent what the gameplay was outside of running around a super boring looking world with mechanics that just looked really odd. Nothing about this was making me go, aha! If anything, it looked like a tech demo of Sonic in an open world, and honestly, not a very good one. However, while the Switch footage shown in the Partner Showcase was obviously scaled down, it didn't look too compromised. Plus, they showed off unique areas, levels that looked like your typical modern 3D Sonic game, which gave this Direct the honor of housing the best Frontiers footage we had seen thus far. Mario Plus Rabbit's Sparks of Hope got a meaty bit of focus alongside a release date of October. Uh, this game Harvestella by Square Enix was a farming-based RPG, but the big news here, at the very end, was the announcement of Persona 3 Portable, 4 Golden, and 5 Royal finally coming to Nintendo Switch. Yawn! I mean, this is awesome, but imagine if we were like two years younger. I feel this would have been more impactful if done earlier. Because at this point, I mean, prior this month, these exact Persona games were already announced to be coming to Xbox. And we had already gotten so much Persona on Nintendo Switch outside of the main series that it all led to this moment of us finally getting them feeling a little underwhelming. We waited so long, and I think it was a little too long. But hey, that doesn't take away from this being a great thing, and that surely doesn't take away from this being a great Direct Mini. Hell, I'd say this would have been amazing as a standard Nintendo Direct. But for that, we have Xenoblade Chronicles 3 with the Xenoblade 3 Direct. Yeah, I really like the use of verbs in this direct. What, do you want me to act like I watched this? Outside of the Nintendo Direct realm, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet received standalone trailers showing off the open world and a release date in November, but there was a ton of rumors and leaks floating around this month. Reports of a 1-2 Switch sequel in development at Nintendo came about, detailing how the game was bad. Well, that doesn't make sense. This game was actually rumored about for a while. I remember when Switch Sports was revealed, I thought the initial logo animation was for this game. But it turned out that apparently, this project was not testing well. Many employees at Nintendo found it to be flat out abhorrent, and the company was trying to figure out what to do with this thing. Cancel it outright, or just plug your ears, close your eyes, and pray somebody finds value in it. Wait, well, hey, if it ever comes out, I'll be that somebody. Without that, this bat would have been useless. Well, that wasn't the only Nintendo game being rumored about, as we got some leaked images of apparently the next Fire Emblem game, which was reported to have already been finished, which damn, you know, I've been hankering for another Fire Emblem. Also, apparently, a Metroid Prime HD remaster was locked in for the holiday season to coincide with the game's 20th anniversary, alongside GoldenEye 007 achievements popping up on Xbox Live, implying we could see a simultaneous release of the N64 game on Nintendo Switch. Oh man, did you see the Sega Genesis Nintendo Switch Online updates this month? They got Mega Man the Wily Wars! That, that thing never physically released in North America! That's so cool! Xenoblade Chronicles 3. Did you say we know the maid's gonna kill bees? Oh man. I am not somebody qualified to talk about this game. I respect the Xenoblade series, it's just not for me. I've tried every game out, and while they have qualities I like, they just really aren't my thing. But I can't discredit how good of a title 3 is. 
which is honestly all I really took away from the five hours I played. Wow, what a finely crafted video game experience this is. It'd be a shame if I stopped playing right now. Scott, you have mere days to live. You should stop playing any game you know you aren't going to finish. Well, that was convenient. There's nothing about these games I hate but there's nothing that really personally grabs me either. But hey, I continue to try them because you never know if something just hasn't clicked for you yet. I didn't really understand the appeal of Souls games until randomly trying out Dark Souls 3 of all things. I think a lot of the lack of interest in many genres or series has to do with the headspace I'm in at the time, which right now, what the hell is this? This is Mario. I don't want to play this. This is what I want to care about. Any of this. Xenoblade is not for me. From what I've played and gathered, Xenoblade 3 is a fantastic game for veterans of the series and newcomers, willing ones. But for me personally, when it came to RPGs this month, nothing else compared to Live Alive. Yeah, nothing else, I know, I'm surprised too. Live Alive is yet another HD 2D game by Square Enix, once again published by Nintendo outside of Japan, but unlike Octopath Traveler and Triangle Strategy before, this isn't an original title, it's a remake of a Super Famicom game from 1994 that was never localized. Which is understandable, we had more distinctive tastes here in North America. I wasn't aware of this game's existence prior to the remake's announcement, and when I was watching the trailer, I knew this must have been a re-release, but of something on PlayStation or Sega Saturn, surely. <laughs> this would have all been done on Super Nintendo. For how ambitious, complex, rich and deep everything seemed, this felt generations ahead of games out at the time. And generations later, we could all finally officially experience it. Live Alive isn't like other RPGs. Here we have seven different scenarios to choose from, each featuring completely different characters, settings, time periods, hell, even gameplay mechanics. It's basically like seven mini RPGs in one, ranging from 30 minutes to four hours long a pop. Makes it really hard to get burnt out on this game, though it also makes it hard to get fully invested. Kind of like a book of short stories, you know? Uh, like, they're charming, but there's not much more to these. Because of that, I wouldn't say any particular scenario in Live Alive was a huge standout to me. Rather, it was the experience as a whole that won me over. Any of these by themselves aren't all too amazing, but being a part of the package is what makes Live Alive amazing. I'd say this is one of the most easily consumable RPGs from the 90s. It's only like 20 hours long, dead simple to jump in and start playing, and if you dropped it for a bit and pick it back up, there's no shame in not remembering what's going on or what you should be doing. Just fire up a new chapter, who cares? Live Alive is awesome. This is a game that just feels special while you play it. And I'm so happy that the entire world can finally play not only one of the most groundbreaking, unique titles from the Super Famicom, but the definitive version of it as well. I salute you, Live Alive. My one complaint, no cat rabbit. Ah, uh, what Live Alive could have been. Klonoa Fantasy Reverie Series. What is that? What is this? A series of platformers with Nothing left to lose. And it's a shame because Klonoa has so much spunk. These are lovely games. And Fantasy Reverie series aims to make them as accessible as possible. Klonoa, Dorda Phantom Isle, and Klonoa 2, Lunatea's Veil are included. The whole series. Outside of the Game Boy Advance games, the Wonder Swan game, Klonoa Beach Volleyball, and Alpine Racer 3. so newcomers will be completely lost. But I'll take what I can get, and Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series is pretty all right. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you and act like I think Klonoa is this groundbreaking absolute must-play title. I mean, McKinley didn't play it, why should you? These are just really solid platformers. Though, they've never really gone farther than that for me personally. Consider me barely obsessed with this series. But I love to see more from this franchise. I really enjoy playing these two here, and it's Great to see this release do better than the Wii remake, my lord. We also got Capcom Arcade Second Stadium this month. Would you believe I gave a shit? Fooled you. Capcom just releases all these damn compilations with many containing the same games. What the hell is the point of this when four titles are already in the Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection, six were in the Capcom Fighting Collection last month? Oh, we had that problem with the first Arcade Stadium. So many inclusions are just already available in compilations on this system. 
I guess the benefit of this is the release method. Arcade Second Stadium is a free download, then you can just buy the games you want. It kind of makes me question why they don't just add these to the first Arcade Stadium as downloadable content. But it's all about having options, baby. And to be fair, these games are two bucks a pop individually, which is very cheap. You may not get online multiplayer and the more refined features of the dedicated compilations, but the more I talk about this one, the more it seems like a reasonable product to offer. Problem is, I already own most of Capcom's previously released compilations, so to hell with you, Capcom! I'll stick to Capcom. News this month felt like you could maybe cobble together a Nintendo Direct if you tried, but I mean, it wouldn't be pretty. We mostly got news in the form of social media posts, like the reveal of Kirby's Dream Buffet. Yeah, that's right, more Kirby, just what we need after more Kirby, which is just what we need after more Kirby, which is just what we Dream need Buffet was thought of to be Kirby, Nintendo's answer to Fall Guys. My response to that is, Kirby, what was the question they were answering? I think Fall Guys Kirby, already had a bit of a Kirby-esque look to it all, so you put Kirby in an online Kirby, multiplayer party racing game and yeah it's gonna give off that stench but this was obviously very much its own thing and just seemed to be a low effort project downloadable Kirby games in the past have just been expanded standalone re-releases of mini games and pre-existing titles so to see this completely new idea that was entirely its own thing was really awesome uh, that wasn't the only Kirby news this month more Kirby There's a Diva 6? Bayonetta 3 received a huge release day trailer, locking in October 28th alongside a Splatoon 3 Nintendo Switch OLED and Pro Controller announcement. Speaking of which, Nintendo privated the original trailers for the OLED and Nintendo Switch Lite on their YouTube channel, leading many to speculate on if a revision was coming, thus getting rid of these videos to avoid any confusion. That or an intern lost a bet. May, June, July... Uh, the, the, the month with Kirby's Dream Buffet, what's its name? Uh, well, lo and behold, Kirby's Dream Buffet launched in that month for a cool $14.99, which was a bit surprising considering the online multiplayer focus. I think many were expecting it to be free to play or a Nintendo Switch Online perk, but after playing it, well damn, that would have made sense now, wouldn't it? Kirby's Dream Buffet is a quality time, there's not much wrong with it. Not much past one hour though. Yeah, I thought this was a cute little release with a lot of heart and cool ideas, but unfortunately, it just doesn't have enough going on to warrant playing more than twice. You control one of many Kirbys competing in races and minigames to eat the most on the course. It's a simple concept that's expanded upon in creative and smart ways throughout the handful of stages included. Uh, there's so many little touches and design elements that make this feel like it could be a premium and legendary Nintendo multiplayer experience but it doesn't quite get there. I feel that it should have been free to play or more fleshed out at a higher price because as it stands, it just feels more like a distraction than a legitimate release. If it was free to play, yeah, bleh, but I feel like that would have pushed it to have a longer life of updates and new content. Though I would prefer a bigger standard release. Add to it all a bit more, you know? Maybe even a single player campaign. Make it like Katamari Damacy, but with Kirby. I don't know, don't get me wrong, I do like this but more so out of respect. I don't have the urge to play this again. I wish I did, but at the end of the day, Kirby's Dream Buffet is a fine little time waster and nothing more. Well, outside of the name of a month. Now, I actually tried this out a few months after launch because this month I dedicated to diving headfirst into Pac-Man World Repack instead. Listen, man, the Pac-Man World games aren't anything groundbreaking. Oh, wow, you're trying to tell me this has nothing to do with that? But for the most part, they're quality, basic 3D platformers. It's hard to feel bad while playing these. It's also hard to feel in general. Because, man, Pac-Man World is pretty damn generic, all things considered. It doesn't mean it's bad. It's just pretty skippable overall. I think the most important thing this game did was gracefully evolve Pac-Man into far more than just those classic arcade games. You have enough recognizable elements, but now with actual characters, a world, just anything more than this. And the foundation laid by Pac-Man World would be continued for years until it wasn't. A lot of franchises in the late 2000s, early 2010s kind of had a back to basics moment, which was cool in some regards, but also gutted a lot of the personality from them. 
So for Pac-Man World to come back, I'm all for it. I love the maze-based Pac-Man games, but that's all we've gotten from this franchise for the past few years. And if you want Pac-Man to be interesting again, you gotta do something new, something old. Repack is a complete remake of the PS1 original, even considerably tweaking the story to not include Miss Pac-Man. Now, does Repack do anything to make- No. No, it doesn't. I don't know what I was about to say, but it doesn't do it. It's the best way to play Pac-Man World, but it's still Pac-Man World. It's like, damn. This is fucking crazy! A great modern remake of an average 3D platformer from the 90s. But that's okay. Like I said with KO the Kangaroo, not every game needs to be genre-defining. It's nice to play something like this that's just pleasant. I quite like this game. I'm really happy it was brought back and not forgotten like it seemingly was for the past decade or so. And I hope Namco continues with this style moving forward. I love Pac-Man being characterized like this in an actual world. It's good for the franchise and it's good for me. Because I derive most of my self-worth from if Pac-Man has legs. Following up Shredder's Revenge, we got Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles The Kawabunga Collection. An incredible compilation of nearly all of Konami's games based on the property from 1989 to 1994. I mean, you have it all here. Every version of every game you could ask for from this era. Many with online multiplayer, plus so much bonus content. This is one of the best compilations of all time. And the fact it's of a licensed property makes it that much more impressive. I mean, these are the types of games that just don't get re-released, and when they do, they're in disgusting condition. So to have this release at the quality it did, with the quantity of content included... <laughs> huh, not a dream. Well, I'm pissed. RPG Time, The Legend of Right, and Blossom Tales 2 were some standout indie releases. Alongside the Neo Geo Pocket Color game, Mega Man Battle and Fighters launching. My god, that is such an obscure-ass Japanese-only title, but now it's on the eShop for like eight bones. That is so cool. Cool! I love this kind of junk, man. This month had some fun moments, but there's something missing. That's it! I haven't gotten assaulted with mediocrity in months! Let's check out Wave 2 of the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass DLC. Well, the track selection this time around is far more inspired. Multiple fan favorites like Waluigi Pinball, Mushroom Gorge, Calamari Desert, and hell, we even got a brand new course, Sky High Sunday. Uh, though this was obviously created with Mario Kart Tour in mind. Now, how do we know that? It stinks! Damn, this track is boring as hell. Especially considering this game already has a dessert theme course, so it's real easy to compare and contrast the two and see how this one falls flat. This layout is just so bland and honestly feels fan-made. Some things just don't make sense, like these rails giving you a boost, like what sense does that make? SNES Mario Circuit 3? Eh, yeah, yeah, Saiyan will be reincarnated. Eh, yeah, yeah. This isn't a weird middle ground between fully remade and fully faithful to the 16-bit original, just like it was in Mario Kart Wii and Mario Kart Tour and Mario Kart Super Circuit. Why is this the one that always comes back? I definitely prefer how a track like GBA Mario Circuit looks, as it maintains the retro aesthetic while not coming off as cheap as hell like this one does. If you wanted the full-blown retro style, man, wouldn't it have been cool if the entire track looked 16-bit? That would have been rad! Like Donkey Kong Jr. in Mario Kart Tour, but instead, it would be the course that was pixelated rather than the character. The tracks from Tour, New York Minute, and Sydney Sprint, they're fine, definitely more memorable than some of the others, especially Sydney Sprint with its music. But they keep the Mario Kart Tour tradition alive with these tracks. What tracks? Just really forgettable. Fine in the moment, but there's never any reason to play these outside of maybe the music being good or the cool atmosphere, because more often than not, the track layouts themselves are just pretty bland. Even when many of them instill the same gimmick as Paris Promenade, with changes occurring each lap. Waluigi Pinball and Mushroom Gorge are great to have back, but they really ain't all too different. Unlike Calamari Desert, which does similar stuff to the tour tracks, each lap has a new layout, and it really helps add some spunk to a track that's 
a classic, yes, but definitely needed more to stand out in the modern day. And they did just that. And Snowland is just pleasant as hell, man. Growing up with Super Circuit, this was a joy to have remade for the music alone. Uh, but the course itself is pretty solid and looks decent too. There's obviously more effort put into this wave. You could tell the developers were listening to feedback. Hell, they even went back to Coconut Mall to address the complaint of the static cars at the end. After the Wave 2 update, they move now. Things were looking up for the booster course pass. Now, much like how they were looking up for Splatoon 3 as we got the Splatoon 3 Direct this month. However, gotta be honest, I just didn't care. I like Splatoon, and while Splatoon 3 was looking good, and this Direct showcased some cool new things about it, it just wasn't something I was actively interested or excited about. I was just down to pick up the game when it released next month, try it out, and that was that. Which is at least more than I can say about the Pokemon Presents a week earlier. These presentations have devolved to the point where they're all practically the same thing. Oh yes, more news on Pokemon Cafe Remix and Unite and my diagnosis? You're f***ing miserable. Something awakened inside me this month. A general disinterest in Splatoon. Splatoon 3! I've always enjoyed the Splatoon franchise, but my interest in it definitely peaked with the first entry. That was such a unique game at the time in every way. The gameplay, the aesthetics, it gave the Wii U a completely original new title that was unlike anything else out there. I played this one a fair bit, and while it had some issues, such as a lack of content at launch, not only was it great to see a brand new AAA Nintendo IP, but for it to be this addictive, charming, and overall great, made this one of that console's defining moments. Now do it again. Splatoon 2 launched just two years later, which made sense considering this was for Nintendo Switch in its launch year, and with how popular the first game was, you would want to keep that momentum going with your brand new console. And obviously, that was the right call to make. That game went on to sell a metric numbers worth of copies, but for me personally, I wasn't necessarily hankering for more Splatoon at the time. It was so soon after the first game, on top of two launching with minimal content again, and the content that was there, like the single player campaign, it just felt like more of the same from Splatoon 1. I just didn't care. Of course, you had cool new additions like Salmon Run mode, there were more multiplayer stages, and it looked a lot better, even if at the time it was hard to tell. And nowadays, it's so easy to see how much they improved on in Splatoon 2. And that goes for the game in general. I don't want to downplay how good of a game this is. I'm just explaining why it didn't really grab me, and by the time I was willing to give it another try... Fast forward to Splatoon 3's reveal in February of 2021, and all I could think of was how unnecessary it felt. Once again, I wasn't hankering for Splatoon because I barely even played more than a few hours of Splatoon 2, and with all the new content they added, I could very easily just pop that into the same console Splatoon 3 was releasing on and get my fix right then and there. As a casual enjoyer of the series, this game wasn't showing me any reason to want it outside of being a new release, so more people would be playing it. Over the year and a half build up to launch, which is quite long by modern Nintendo standards, and no trailer or announcement ever interested me about this one. It just felt like the same song and dance from the first two games. Oh, the single player trailer features multiplayer footage, then it's interrupted by a transmission. A Salmon Run, it's pretty much the same thing from the last game, which this all inspired a ton of discourse I saw. Critics would say, Splatoon 3 looks the same, it needs to be more different. Defenders would respond, it's a sequel, what are you expecting? It's not going to be a completely new experience. And while I understand both sentiments, even if I am definitely more on the critic side, I feel like there was a fair amount of miscommunication going on, like neither side actually knew what the other was trying to say. I think I was looking for that major hook, that new gimmick to set Splatoon 3 apart from the others. While core fans understood that this is an online multiplayer game, Splatoon 2 is pretty old at this point, so you need a new, refined release to bring in a larger player base. Plus, those fans already noticed loads of gameplay and visual differences, more than enough to warrant making a new game. Neither side is wrong here, but considering my history with the franchise up to this point and Splatoon 3 launching on the same system as Splatoon 2 and to the untrained eye not doing all too much to differentiate itself, I was not excited for this game, though I still picked it up, played it at launch, and...
Splatoon 3 is good, but man, I just don't have much passion for this one. It's like, I don't know what to say. It's Splatoon. So I'm thankful this one didn't launch half-baked like the others and felt much more like a proper sequel compared to Splatoon 2 when that released, which felt far more like Splatoon 1.5. The single player here is pretty substantial. I love how it starts out like any other Splatoon single player, then expands into this massive world, which is exactly what I wanted out of a Splatoon story mode until you actually enter the levels and they're all just self-contained missions. This feels way more challenge mode than actual campaign. It's still good, don't get me wrong, very similar to Splatoon 2's Octo Expansion DLC. But looking at this giant hub world, it feels destined for so much more. With how much Splatoon pushes its lore, its universe, it wants you to feel like this is all a living, breathing world, going as far as making the user experience worse because of it. All for the single player to be the most video game levely things imaginable. And they're good video game levely levels, but it just confuses the hell out of me. This hub world shows how cool a more open sandbox style Splatoon campaign could be. Imagine something like Bowser's Fury or Mario Odyssey, but with Splatoon mechanics. That would be incredible. But instead, we have a single player that's fun and well designed, yet I always felt teased by. This opening cutscene, Splatsville, the single player hub, they all gave me hope we'd have a far larger world than usual. But in the end, this is just sort of more of the same presented as if it's not. But obviously, the multiplayer is the main draw with this title, and it's Splatoon multiplayer. It's fun. I don't know. There's a plethora of content here, enough to easily recommend Splatoon 3 to anybody interested. But my god, I just have nothing to say about this game other than it's more Splatoon. Splatoon is fun. I'm sad. I definitely played this more than I did with Splatoon 2, so take that for what it's worth. I do understand why this game exists now, as yes, for an online multiplayer oriented series like this, you do need to freshen things up via new releases. There's only so many updates you can do to Splatoon 2 until you just need to straight up make a new game. And they do enough here, but not enough for me to be head over heels in love with it. Splatoon 3 is a good game, but one I just don't have any strong feelings about. God, I could use a game that made me feel something. Anything! I feel sorry. So Square Enix put two RPGs out this month. Both nonsense titles, both similar logos to not only each other, but Triangle Strategy and Octopath Traveler and Bravely Default. Both pretty damn mediocre, both getting little to no fanfare upon release. What the hell was going on here? Oh, Square Enix put two nonsense titled mediocre RPGs with similar logos out in the same month. That's what happened. You know what else got little to no fanfare? Shovel Knight Dig. I feel that the constant support the original game got throughout its life, while groundbreaking and wildly generous of the developers, alongside constant cameos of the character in other titles, made getting anything new from Shovel Knight feel pretty insubstantial. Which is a shame because Shovel Knight Dig is Damn good. This is such a cool spin-off that honestly could be looked at as a full-blown follow-up in many ways. Takes the mechanics from Shovel Knight and puts it all into this roguelike platformer focused on digging downwards. It's a really smart and effective use of the franchise that feels familiar, yet is pretty much completely different from the first game. The music and visuals are phenomenal, the gameplay is addictive with arcade-like qualities, and this is some of the best procedurally generated level design I've ever seen. They all feel so handcrafted, it's insane! Great title here, definitely a huge recommendation from me. But what if you're more of a FIFA 23 Legacy Edition guy? Play Shovel Knight Dig. Yep, another year, another farted out FIFA for Nintendo's Switch. Uh, we also got the standard NBA 2K, an 8th Picross S title, and a uh, reason to live. Temtem launched this month after hearing about this game for years, being considered the Pokemon killer, an MMO that looked to be everything everybody has ever wanted that franchise to become, and then some, during a period in which Pokemon has been churning out non-stop disappointments. Well, this didn't do a damn thing. Let's be honest, it's gonna take a lot for any franchise, new or old, to actually actually be much of a legitimate rival to Pokemon. Especially when I think a big appeal is the fact that it's Pokemon. Replace all of these with IOUs. I don't think the franchise would last much longer. Return to Monkey Island, revival of the legendary point and click series that turned out pretty damn legendary itself. This is fantastic. 
really unfortunate how upset some people were at the graphical style, but that's understandable. It's human nature to threaten violence over how my funny pirate game looks. It's fine if you don't like how this looks, especially considering how the series did evolve to fully 3D. I can understand this feeling like a downgrade. But pretty much every game had its own unique art style, with many being in 2D and exaggerated and cartoonish. Is this really out of the ordinary here? I personally think it's a nice style that truly comes together well while actually playing the game, which in itself is a treat. Just a fantastic point and click with so much love and energy. And Tunic is the same, but for top-down adventure games, which also released on Switch this month. And the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim Anniversary Edition is the same, but for shitty deals. Yeah, this was a surprise release and it's 70 bones no less. Basically, it's Skyrim at 60 with a $20 DLC pack included at a discount, which is a crime in comparison to the other platforms where it's only $49.99 for the whole package, which includes includes Skyrim Special Edition instead of basic ass Skyrim on Switch. Wow, what a waste of money. Let me buy it to confirm. Wow, what a waste of money. The Life is Strange Arcadia Bay Collection. Wait, hasn't this already released? Remember E3 2021? They announced the whole Life is Strange series was coming there. What the hell happened? Thank you for your answer. Game releases may have been plentiful this month, but with it being September, you know it was all about the Nintendo Direct debuting on the 13th. You know, over the past few years, I've come to realize the September Directs are usually not as big of deals. What makes me say that? I mean, it makes sense. These are leading into the holiday season where we know of most games releasing already, so I've come to lower my expectations for the presentations around this time of year. Well, at least when it comes to my interests. But hot damn, we finally have a Direct for me. Story of Seasons, Fae Farm, Rune Factory, Harvestella, the son of a bitch, I wanted five. This Direct was off and mocked due to the overwhelming amount of farming games on display, which wasn't as annoying to me as the people who are still making fun of it. You give Nintendo fans a joke to make and they won't make one. The farming game focus didn't even register to me at first, mainly because I think I was already zoning out during these segments. Definitely wasn't the strongest direct, but don't take that as it was bad. I mean, we opened up with the reveal of the next mainline Fire Emblem game, Fire Emblem Engage, releasing in just a few months. I'm so excited. Is this logo using the switch? Font. It Takes Two and Sifu get Switch ports that look pretty rough. Nintendo Switch Sports Golf is delayed. Oh man, hopefully these announcements get better. Well, how about Fatal Frame Mask of the Lunar Eclipse? A remaster of a Japanese Wii exclusive, finally available worldwide, that's pretty rad. Or how about Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line? Oh, Tales of Symphonia remastered, Radiant Silver Gun, which released that day. A wave three of the Booster Course Pass was teased. The Master Detective Archives Rain code? There were a lot of cool announcements here between another look at Disney Speedstorm, why has this been a part of two directs, with a few big boy reveals like Octopath Traveler 2. And I think this is where I started to feel the HD 2D style was overstaying its welcome a bit. I just personally feel that for original games like Octopath, Triangle Strategy, and now Octopath 2, there's not enough that's really visually distinct between these three. Plus, within one year, we were to get three games that use this art style. It's just starting to feel like they're going overboard here. You can keep using HD 2D, but mix it up a bit. You can definitely push this style more and experiment with what's possible with it, because as it stands, I can't wait for Octopath Traveler 2. God damn it, this is Triangle Strategy. More Nintendo 64 games were announced for the expansion pack, with basically the entirety of next year's lineup detailed. The first three Mario Parties were an awesome surprise, considering how Nintendo has only ever re-released Mario Party 2. But that announcement was completely overshadowed by GoldenEye. Yep, they finally worked it out. Stuck in complete licensing hell for decades, all the parties who owned a piece of this pie came together and agreed upon a deal. I don't know if it's a good deal, but that hasn't stopped me elsewhere. Microsoft, who owns the original developer of the game Rare, would also be getting the game on Xbox with full widescreen and 4K, utilizing a more modern control scheme. While the Nintendo Switch Online version would just be the basic game, but because it's a part of Nintendo Switch Online, you'd get online multiplayer. 
So they made sure both versions kinda suck. Well, good thing I have both consoles. I can play both mediocre golden eyes and experience the best of both, the worst of both, and the act of wasting time. Resident Evil Village, seven, two remake, and three remake cloud versions. Yep. Pikmin Bloom, a mobile app that released a year prior, Pikmin 4. Ah! Oh my god! Okay, so there wasn't a ton they showed here outside of a small clip, some screenshots, the new logo, and the release year of 2023. But man, how neat! It's about time we got anything from this game that was apparently damn near done 10 years ago. Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe was then announced just directly after he sizzle reeled games, just like Okay. Yeah, after Kirby in the Forgotten Land and Kirby's Dream Buffet, we're getting a full remake of Return to Dreamland on Wii. Was not on my bingo card, mostly considering I thought we were just playing bingo. This was one of those announcements that just kind of left me perplexed. Like, this game didn't need a remake. We didn't need another Kirby and another 2D Kirby at that. But I wasn't upset or anything. I thought, sure, why not? I'll play that again. At this point, it feels like many of the remakes Nintendo goes forth with are chosen by Dart Throw, and we got lucky here. And the final announcement was a teaser for Breath of the Wild 2, now officially titled Tears of the Kingdom. What the hell does that spoil? We end with the release day reveal of May 12th, 2023. Other than that, this trailer barely showed off anything. Honestly, pretty weak end to an average direct, all things considered. And nothing groundbreaking, but some good stuff here. Though that wasn't all the news in September. We got the announcement for a Pokemon Scarlet and Violet Nintendo Switch OLED, more Sega Genesis games on Nintendo Switch Online, Rayman will appear in DLC for Mario Plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope, uh, wait, let me rephrase that. Uh, Rayman will appear in DLC for a game I don't give a damn about? Oh, that's pretty cool. And I don't like saying that because Mario Plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope is one of the most passion-fueled experiences I have ever witnessed. Just look at this game. They really went above and beyond to take Mario Plus Rabbids to the next level. But I'm not gonna lie to you and act like I really wanted that. I gave the original a few hours of my time recently and yeah, it's pretty good but didn't feel like it should have been more than just a cool thing that happened once. I think if this game proved anything, it wasn't that Mario Plus Rabbids should be its own series. Rather, this team at Ubisoft is unbelievably talented and should be trusted with more projects, how more Nintendo projects even. Because while doing another Mario Plus Rabbids is fine, it doesn't have the same allure as the first game. That game sounded dreadful when it was just a rumor. But slowly as more and more details began leaking, culminating with a whole damn internal presentation describing the entire thing getting out there, it became easier and easier to accept the idea of this crossover. And by the time it was officially unveiled, it was exciting. The game looked legitimately well made and was out in just three months, all in the Switch's launch year. Hell, it was the first brand new Mario game on the console. It was such a crazy idea that apparently turned out to be a solid title when Switch releases were more sparse, so when this came out, more people than you'd expect gave it a go. Everything fell perfectly into place with the original Mario Plus Rabbids, which can't be said for Sparks of Hope. It took a year and a half to release during one of the busiest months on the platform, and it just didn't invoke the same morbid curiosity the first one did. Plus, it wasn't really filling a niche. Uh, there's a reason my family lives by the code, the Nintendo Switch has a lot of turn-based tactics games. So while I never thought this game looked anything less than fantastic and never wanted it to fail, it just was never at the top of my priority list. And nobody else's! Yeah, this game underperformed according to Ubisoft, and I think everything I just listed is entirely to blame here. Which doesn't include the quality because, oh my god! They could have just done the first game again with new environments and a few improvements, but they genuinely went back to the drawing board to rethink how this game works. It's still Mario plus Rabbids, but evolved significantly. You can now move around without being restricted to a grid. Exploration is far deeper and more involved. The world's expanded, the stakes are higher. Though while these are all improvements, they sort of turned this game into something I don't think it needed to be. This feels less like a Mario and Rabbids game, and more so Mario and Rabbids going on an intergalactic journey to other worlds. Oftentimes, Sparks of Hope is closer to an original game than either Mario or Rabbids. And while I respect this, I'm not sure if going bigger and more original is what I wanted after Kingdom Battle. Plus, 
this series just feels like official fan fiction that's still non-canon. At the end of the day, despite everything this game does well, I just didn't really care. But if you're looking for a solid tactics game, you can't go wrong with this, or help, even the first one. They're great games, but damn it, they just aren't a priority to play for me. There were so many other games that released this month, such as Bayonetta 3. This was a big deal. I mean, Bayonetta 2 was a Game of the Year nominee back in 2014, so it's pretty monumental to get a follow-up here in the year 2019. What coma? Nearly made it 10 years since the last one and five years since the announcement, but alas, Bayonetta 3 finally released, and it was pretty damn solid, even though I think the wait for it was a bit ridiculous. Apparently the game ran into some development issues, would you believe? There was talk about it being open world at one point, the Switch hardware holding them back, thus having to restructure the game. And after playing it, yeah, you can sort of tell this game was meant to be on a far larger scale. That's not to say what's here isn't great in of itself and doesn't come together, because Bayonetta 3 is a complete package that oftentimes is better than 1 and 2 but oftentimes it's far worse. This is definitely the most divisive of the series. Doesn't mean it's anything less than great, but I've seen many a critique on the story of this one, which is something I deeply care about in my Bayonetta games. Oh wait, I thought this word was pronounced story. My bad. Not saying I'm right here, it's just to me, Bayonetta's plot is simply there to get us from action set piece to action set piece. I find it to be fun and ridiculous, but if it's bad, I don't really care. However, with this game focusing on multiverses, one aspect of the story that I'm actually not a fan of is that it doesn't do as much with this as it could have. A Bayonetta game traveling across dimensions? I mean, look at what Bayonetta 2 did. Now you have this MacGuffin to do literally whatever you want. And what, sand? These areas are still fun and the hack and slash gameplay is better than ever. But the Bayonetta series is very consistent. So while 3 does a ton of new things, I'd say the best way to describe it is more Bayonetta. I don't think this was as groundbreaking as 2 was when it released. In fact, I feel that 2 is probably the best overall. Uh, while 3's highs are higher, a 2 is more consistent all the way through. But damn, Bayonetta 3 is one of the greatest hack and slashes of the generation, if not of all time. Regardless of any criticism, I think it's fair to say this is a worthy entry in the series. So <laughs> who the hell cares which one is better? Just play all of them. You know, with Bayonetta being M-rated gets me in the mood to hear the word more. Let's continue the trend with what could have been. Yep, Persona 5 Royal launched this month in terrific shape. This port is phenomenal. It's fully featured and runs great. Uh, any differences or downgrades are negligible and or expected, but don't impact the experience. This is Persona 5 Royal on Nintendo Switch. Uh, something I wish I could have said years ago. Too little too late, man. I mean, just imagine if this released in 2019, 2020. That would have hit the spot. But by October of 2022, I mean, it's just harder to be as enthusiastic about these Switch ports, man. Oh my God. Okay, to be fair, Persona 5 was originally on PlayStation 3, so it's not like it wouldn't run on Switch. We've been teased by constant Persona spin-offs, Jokers and Smash Brothers, his costumes in Tokyo Mirage Sessions, they put the damn cat in Monkey Ball, like, come on, he's not even a ball! There's always been a justified expectation for this game on the platform, whereas Nier Automata, I mean, yeah, this has consistently been one of the most requested ports to this console, but that didn't make it any less shocking upon confirmation. And much like Persona 5, this looks and runs amazingly for Switch. Of course, if you nitpick them, you can find downgrades, but while you're playing, everything just feels right. These are the real deal. Two uncompromised dream ports in the same month. Help make that three. Okay, well, that's a dream dream port. Gosh, I wish I cared. No Man's Sky for Nintendo Switch. Who asked for this? Oh my God, guys, it's Weird Motherfucker. Oh, hi. I love this game. Definitely wasn't a port I ever expected in 2022, no less, both in terms of player demand and the possibility of it running on Switch. But after a rocky launch in 2016, No Man's Sky has definitely improved over time and has become a pretty commendable experience, well enjoyed by many players. So while I've been questioning its existence on Switch, that was more so my initial thought when this version was announced, because obviously this is a tremendous addition to the console's lineup, as it runs surprisingly well considering the monumental scope of this game, which, yeah, October has been filled with ports like this. 
Variety is the spice of life. Alan Wake Remastered. This just randomly popped up, no warning whatsoever. Uh, like an armed felon. Ew. Yeah, that's why I say towards armed felons. This is one of the most pathetic Switch ports I've ever seen. Mainly because it didn't need to be. Alan Wake is an Xbox 360 game. How the Switch version is as crusty as it is, is beyond me. Uh, obviously, they took the remastered edition for the higher-end systems, then downgraded that for this release, which they sure did that. This did get patched a few months later, ironing out many of the major issues, though still leaving the game in a visually unappealing state. I feel like you should expect visual downgrades for Switch versions of modern titles. Obviously, it's a trade-off for portability. But for a game like this, which was on the Xbox 360, I mean, none of the major ports this month had these kind of issues, and those were PS4 games. What excuse does this have? Oh, okay. Overwatch 2 hit Switch this month, but considering how this effectively replaced Overwatch 1, I consider this more of a free update than a new game. A new Tales from the Borderlands, yeah, that just sort of happened now, didn't it? I heard nobody talk about this, much like Atari Mania, which is WarioWare but themed around classic Atari games. A pretty fun idea, though instead of playing any of these, it's only fair when game publishers waste their time, I waste mine too. Let's bitch! Cloud versions of both Resident Evil Village and A Plague Tale Requiem. Uh, you know, cloud versions have slowed down a bit on Switch this year, which I am thankful for, even if I do understand why they exist. In most cases, it's this or nothing. But it is so annoying when these are shown off in Nintendo Directs and you go on these games Wikipedia pages and Nintendo Switch is listed as one of the platforms and it's like, no! Starfield is an Xbox Series X and S exclusive, but I can stream it on my Xbox One. Why not put Xbox One on its platforms list? Whatever, at the end of the day, these two, they don't offend me because I was never really expecting them to run on Switch natively anyways. But my god, they just always feel like a waste of air to discuss. I gotta save that up for more important stuff. Wave 2 of the Xenoblade Chronicles 3 expansion pass released this month. I bought Pokemon Scarlet and Violet this month and was blown away by the sheer quality. It's fearless attitude to go above and beyond and being so fresh, so innovative, so frankly incredible. Oh my god, I I'm sorry, I got these words mixed up again. <clears throat> huh? Now, I personally barely paid attention to these games prior to release. Of course, I'm already not a big Pokemon fan, but this one really snuck up on me, unlike any prior titles. I think a new generation just didn't feel justified at that time. I mean, we got Sword and Shield in 2019, DLC in 2020, remakes of Diamond and Pearl in 2021, then just a few months later in January of 2022, a brand new take on the series with Pokemon Legends Arceus. Then, just one month later, blam! Whole new generation. Like, did this feel necessary to happen within one year of two mainline Pokemon releases? It was just concerning considering how brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, and Legends Arceus all felt half-baked to an extent. And you were adding ANOTHER game to the release schedule? One with a scope larger than anything Game Freak has ever attempted? Right after they just launched the game with a scope larger than anything Game Freak has ever attempted? None of this made sense to me timing-wise. I mean, game development is lengthy, it's difficult, and this developer has been having the hardest time lately adapting to modern standards. And you're telling me you're gonna gamble on launching this in a passable state? Let's go to the casino! No! Pokemon Scarlet and Violet received the lowest reviews of any mainline Pokemon title, featuring the worst performance from any Nintendo game I've ever seen. The entire experience is riddled with low resolution crustiness. Anything that isn't a main focus at the moment runs at a quarter of the frame rate. There's a new graphical hiccup every other frame. You can easily tell where corners were cut all the time. The game crashes more than it ever should. Egregious pop-up slowdown glitches easily. One of the biggest slaps in the face of a product Nintendo or any company has ever offered. However, well, he stabbed me in the face, but I'll hear him out. I will give credit where credit is due, because one of the big complaints with Sword and Shield was how complacent the series had gotten doing the bare minimum same old, same old. So for Game Freak to attempt an open world this time proves that the resistance to evolving Pokemon wasn't the issue. It was the lack of time and experience to do so. 
I can see a great game here that's severely bogged down by a lack of polish. If this project had one more year to iron out these issues, I don't think it would be perfect, but it would be a hell of a lot better than this. It's just so unfortunate because this open world formula works incredibly well for Pokemon. The sense of freedom helps invoke that feeling of adventure and discovery the franchise was built upon. Though this isn't a radical shift for the series, as it still follows the same beats as any of the other ones. But regardless, it still feels like one of the larger evolutions in the franchise. They are truly trying to do something new, and in some ways, they succeeded. The core gameplay of Scarlet and Violet is pretty good. As somebody who doesn't care for Pokemon, I genuinely felt this was inching towards something I could enjoy. Inching towards. Yeah, still not for me. Uh, but with this and Legends Arceus, I do believe we're moving towards a day where there will be a Pokemon game I enjoy. Hell, I'd take ironically at this point. Scarlet and Violet are valiant efforts to evolve Pokemon. I can tell Game Freak cares and doesn't want to just do the same exact thing every time. Obviously, they could have just made a reskinned Sword and Shield and it would have sold a comparable amount. But the lack of experience they have with HD development and the time span demanded to push this game alongside trading cards, anime, merchandise, the works, it all led to the kind of game Nintendo fans would often brag about never getting. Nintendo's releases are polished to oblivion as bug-free as possible. They care tremendously about the user experience. Except when it comes to Pokemon. Why the hell is that? Because it has to come out to coordinate with the billions of other Pokemon projects scheduled? Well, I got bad news for you. If the game quality continues to decrease due to the ridiculous deadlines, there's gonna be less people willing to buy into these games and those other projects. So is it really worth it? Yep. Well, November was definitely the month of crusty ass shitty decent games because we also got Sonic Frontiers. This thing had such a wild build up to release. I didn't know what to think of it half the time. Some trailers look good, others look bad. A few I didn't know what the hell they meant. However, when the game seemed to be at its worst, the people who played it at events would defend it, claiming it was actually pretty solid. And as we got closer to launch, the Sega was giving these claims more merit each and every day. The Sonic Frontiers was seeming to be a genuinely good game, and upon release, yeah, it was. Barely. I like Sonic Frontiers, but it is like the most imperfect video game. I feel that if one to two things were tweaked slightly for the worst, the entire package would fall apart. Most of what this game tries to do is fairly mediocre with a few strong elements at play. However, everything comes together to present a competent package that works just enough, and more importantly, is pretty fun. This game genuinely engrossed me, and that was shocking. I mean, this looked like the most cobbled together garbage. Just grabbing random things from modern open world games and simply throwing Sonic in there. And yeah, that's how some of it is. Here's a skill tree for no reason. Leveling up your speed is honestly a waste of time. The puzzles? Half the time, I doubt you could even consider puzzles. Combat is very basic with your parry attack. I don't know if that counts as a parry at that point. But all of this is more than forgivable when it feels this damn good to run around as Sonic. They nailed movement here. It's so enjoyable to speed through these open areas. It makes everything else work. All these mediocre little side activities and platform challenges, they're validated by Sonic's control. It all makes for an experience that feels genuinely fresh and exciting. Even when the world looks like it was made for a different game, they just put Sonic rails in it. The gameplay loop can be pretty tedious here if played for extended periods of time. Uh, normally for me, it amounts to just running around and doing whatever I end up coming across to get a random collectible, which eventually I'll get enough of what I need to progress the game. So as a player, it feels like I'm kind of just screwing around until I accidentally get enough items and can move forward. It's easy for it to feel a bit mindless sometimes. But they spice it up here and there with the cyberspace levels you find throughout the world. Uh, these are the more traditional boost style Sonic stages from games like Colors and Forces, and they're not the best. However, presented in this context, they're a fun enough change of pace from the open world gameplay. You also have the boss fights, which are some of the most electrifying moments in the entire franchise. Uh, the story, while presented via lame ass stilted cutscenes, it's actually pretty solid. The Sonic Frontiers is the most passionately I've enjoyed a 3D Sonic since Generations. 
It has loads of flaws. I mean, just look at the amount of poppin'. But all in all, it's a pretty fun game that establishes a solid blueprint for future Sonic titles. And the Switch version ain't half bad. Of course, downgrades are to be expected. 720p, 30 frames per second compared to 1080, 60 on PS5. But it's a completely playable, competent version of the game. It's not the flashiest port to show off, but I'm honestly impressed with how well it holds up, all things considered. Because, you know, with how even the PS5 version was showing pop in, I was half expecting it to show up on Switch like... The price I pay for portability. Harvest Stella! You know, for how many people I saw claim to be interested in this game when it was shown in the Direct Mini back in June, I saw nobody talk about it. The same goes for the other Square Enix releases like Tactics Ogre Reborn, the Front Mission First Remake by Forever Entertainment. This company puts out games all the time, but never markets them, man. It feels like anything that isn't Final Fantasy or Dragon Quest or Kingdom Hearts, they just sort of let them release, and that's it. They don't talk about them, they just let them happen, and then boom! Well, our games aren't selling, and nobody knows you have games to sell! I was more aware of the damn Atari collection that released this month. The Atari collection! That's pathetic! To be fair, though, this ain't no ordinary collection. Atari 50, the anniversary celebration, is one of the greatest video game compilations ever crafted. Just a shame it's a, you know, that. But this isn't really about the games. I consider this more interactive documentary than anything. You get this beautiful, comprehensive timeline with videos, photographs, 3D models, and of course, playable games to represent Atari throughout the years. And what I really love about this is they go for the jugular. That's right, we don't just have Atari 2600 games like all these other compilations do. We have 5200, 7800, their computer games, Lynx, Jaguar, plus brand new versions of Atari classics made specifically for this release, uh, prototypes, incredibly rare games, games that have never been re-released in any form, all presented alongside phenomenal historic material, if only this was from a company worth a damn. I kid, I love gaming history, and regardless of how much I hanker to play Atari games these days, which it's a little low, so it looks like I'm gonna need some hanker juice. This this is a compilation fit for kings. And the developer Digital Eclipse started a whole line of these interactive game compilation documentaries, which I think is awesome. Seriously, check out Atari 50. It's one of the coolest retro gaming experiences you can have, and I want it to do well so games from companies I actually like get the treatment next. Oddworld, Soulstorm, Mint Takes Two, Sifu, Ark Ultimate Survivor Edition, hell, <laughs> even the Apple Arcade release of the Oregon Trail came over this month. All turned out to be decent enough ports, which I can't say about Resident Evil 2 and 3 Cloud Editions. Guess how decent enough these versions are. <laughs> Thank God I have time to think about my answer. News-wise, an Indie World debuted, same old, same old, some nice indie releases with Sports Story, the follow-up to the indie darling Golf Story from the Switch's launch year, finally getting a December release date, and Masahiro Sakurai teased the possibility of a Kid Icarus Uprising port on his YouTube channel. Why I don't get in the news for doing the same thing is beyond me. Congratulations! You live to see December 2022. It's time to celebrate! Bleh. Yes, the last of the Resident Evil Cloud versions released this month, which strangely was actually the first one in Japan. <laughs> Remember back in May of 2018, Resident Evil 7 was one of the first cloud versions of a game ever released for Nintendo Switch. So in some ways, it was a trailblazer. My trail! Not always a good thing. Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII Reunion. A remake of the PSP game, and probably the closest you'll get to something like Final Fantasy VII Remake on Nintendo Switch. I mean, it's obviously not the same, but a very impressive title on the system nonetheless. Uh, though you can still tell it's a PSP game at its heart, uh, which does make playing it on Switch feel pretty fitting. Dragon Quest Treasures, which, damn, I didn't realize this was a full price release. And on the indie front, we had both River City Girls 2 and River City Girls 2! Wow, what? happened here? Sports Story followed up Golf Story with a buggy and unpolished mess that had even more problems than that. Because at its core, Sports Story focusing on more than just golf made it, well, unfocused. No one sport is anything to write home about outside of, well, golf, and even then, it's better in Golf Story. It's so much more dumbed down here. Thankfully, this game was patched, and overall, I'd say you can still get some enjoyment out of Sports Story. But 
Man, what a downgrade. Speaking of downgrades, the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass received its Wave 3 update this month, and it downgraded from just fine to damn, now I can't make jokes about this anymore. Wow, the quality of these tracks are just getting better and better. Uh, Tour London Loop and Berlin Byways are forgettable as usual, but GBA Boo Lake? They added a lake. They could have added any body of water, but they did this one for the fans. DS Peach Gardens got the biggest changes as the final lap you go through the track backwards. Uh, Wii Maple Treeway is great as always. They, they even brought back the half pipe mechanic from Mario Kart Wii. Uh, while it does feel a bit shoehorned in as Mario Kart 8 wasn't built for something like this, it's still cool to have back in some way. 3DS Rock Rock Mountain is fine. Merry Mountain from Tour is a brilliant Christmas themed course if you don't play it. Yeah, this is one of the most boring layouts in the game. It's so damn basic compared to how crazy the visuals are. Like, oh my god, look at all this stuff going on. I wish I could look at it, but I gotta pay attention to the road. Thankfully, this wave ended with 3DS Rainbow Road, an all-time crate that got a whole lot of love here. The Booster Course Pass has been a blast to follow, as it feels like you're rooting for the underdog, watching them improve over time. The $25 mobile game asset reusing DLC for one of the best-selling games of all time, Underdog. Oh my god, there's like four more leaves than they needed to put here. They do care! In other news, Nintendo announced a brand new game at the Game Awards this year. That being Bayonetta Origins, Cereza, and the Lost Demon, a spin-off prequel to the series, which was very unexpected, uh, but not at the same time, considering this was teased via a secret chapter in Bayonetta 3. Very cool looking title with a gorgeous art style. But in what universe would this do well in? Bayonetta is already a niche series, so you make a spin-off that is completely different tone, style, gameplay, literally everything wise, and I think you have a recipe for a game many Bayonetta fans aren't going to pay attention to. In addition to non-Bayonetta fans, since it's called Bayonetta Origins. I don't want to take away from how cool of a project this is, though. I love seeing developers do this kind of stuff, and really commend Platinum Games and Nintendo for making something like this. I mean, this genuinely feels like a passion project. There's no way they'd produce this thinking it would sell more than 10 copies. Because I only had enough money for nine. During all of this, Microsoft was in the middle of their ongoing quest to purchase Activision. Uh, though to ensure regulators this acquisition would not turn into a monopoly or be bad for the industry, they promised Call of Duty would come to Nintendo for the next 10 years. You know, I wonder what that would look like. Fire Emblem, engage. Fire Emblem Engage, as if. I don't play video games like this, I play video games. Uh, such as Kirby 12, and just kidding, I only play Mario. So obviously, I'm a little upset. I mean, look at how many Fire Emblem games Nintendo put out in 2023 so far compared to Mario games. What dimension is this? As a true Nintendo fan, I am sick of Nintendo releasing Nintendo games in a Nintendo series that has been active since 1990. Then what happened to the old Nintendo? Well, I'll tell you this, I'm not interested in these games because I don't like RPGs, strategy games, anime, and that's all Fire Emblem Engage is. Just a damn waste of time. See, I wasted over 30 hours. I, I played a Fire Emblem game? But I'm the not playing Fire Emblem guy! If I can't get my validation by hating something for the sake of hating it, what's my shtick now? Murder. Yeah, after trying out Engage, I honestly got pretty hooked. This is a phenomenal turn-based strategy game with a dog sh story. Literally, like, every cutscene for the first few hours involves every character you meet just oozing over the fact you're the Divine Dragon. Oh my god, it's the Divine Dragon. Anything for the Divine Dragon? Like, what kind of story is this? Characters say nothing of worth, which would be fine if cutscenes and dialogue segments weren't like a century long. It's just mindless fodder between gameplay sections. And Engage is designed around that first and foremost, which does result in some of the most polished, satisfying, and a Addictive strategy gameplay I've ever experienced. Here is what I've experienced. But Engage genuinely won me over and turned me into a Fire Emblem f played oncer. 
Not sure if this has completely sold me on the series, both past and future titles. Just, after playing Engage, I'm not making my thighs red at the thought of jumping into Tharsius 776. I am satisfied with this right now. But I'm definitely far more willing to give them another shot someday. See, this is what I was saying about Xenoblade. All it takes is that one game. For Fire Emblem, it was the wrong one. So someday, Xenoblade, you will click for me. Maybe someday. Persona 3 Portable and Persona 4 Golden both launched on the same day, and they are exactly what you'd expect. They're nothing crazy, just the original PSP and Vita games on modern consoles. Hell, three portable save file system is ripped directly from the PSP interface. But I can't possibly understate how big of a deal it is we finally got these on consoles. Three portable especially since this was its first re-release ever. And now with these highly demanded titles finally on the console, it's time to move on to a new game to demand for on Nintendo Switch. Son of a bitch requesting these games is all I've got. Power Wash Simulator was a bit of a breakout hit over on Xbox Game Pass, but it feels made for Switch and this version runs damn near flawless. I was half expecting expecting this to run like how the other half of me expected Power Wash Simulator to run on Switch. Not very well. I don't know why. This just seemed like the type of game that you'd assume would have no problem running on Switch but got hit with a quick port job and... There we go. It does actually perform. Which is what I feared we would get with SpongeBob SquarePants The Cosmic Shake as well. So this was pretty interesting. The team behind the remake of Battle for Bikini Bottom returned with a completely new SpongeBob game. The first new console game based on the property since SpongeBob Hero Pants in 2015. How could that be? Be that could how? Basically, this is going to be another game in the style of Battle for Bikini Bottom. I was intrigued. I mean, this was my childhood game, man. Of course I was gonna pick up its spiritual successor. And after giving it a try, I was blown away. The Cosmic Shake accomplished something no other modern licensed kids game could do. It's okay. Yeah, I'm not gonna go wild for a game like this these days. As much as I loved this thing as a kid, I haven't been waiting that entire time for a sequel. I gave up hope in 2010. But from the few hours I sunk into it, I have all the respect in the world for Cosmic Shake. I would have adored this back in the day. And coming to us in 2023 with solid visuals, music, voice acting, level design? I mean, have you seen how stuff like this usually comes out? This was a miracle. I love how it's obviously inspired by and uses the foundation of Battle for Bikini Bottom, but really is its own experience. How practically your whole moveset is completely different. Uh, they're respecting the past while iterating on it. This is a true labor of love. And hey, even the Switch version ain't half bad this time. At least in comparison to Battle for Bikini Bottom Rehydrated. Didn't have to do much. Now, I don't always mention Nintendo Switch Online Retro Game Editions, mainly because I've been trying to be more positive lately, but there's no way I wouldn't talk about the release of GoldenEye 007 this month. I've also been trying to do the unthinkable. It was reported that Nintendo was looking to increase Switch console production like mad this year, which was surprising considering many assumed we were entering the system's final stretch. I mean, in terms of systems selling games, yeah, Tears of the Kingdom was releasing, but it was safe to assume that while it would sell incredibly well, I mean, how many people were actually going to buy a Switch for that game if they didn't already for Breath of the Wild? Son of a bitch. Well, it seems like anything's possible. So, <laughs> GoldenEye 007 on Nintendo Switch Online. It's exactly as advertised. People f***ing hated it. I thought everybody already knew GoldenEye aged like, like age. But actually getting an official re-release with a modern controller that everybody with an expansion pack subscription had access to probably made that sink in a whole lot more. It mostly comes down to the controls, man. A first person shooter designed around, well not fingers, that's for sure. Even with an N64 controller, this doesn't feel great, but hey, it was designed for it, so you try to make do with this, and it just makes me sad, man. This legendary game that obviously took years of negotiations to bring back in some way, pretty much disregarded due to this. The version on Xbox is leagues better due to this alone. Uh, sure, it may not have online multiplayer, but considering how it is on Switch, is that even a pro? Quick, I have $60 and I've only played two Kirby games this year. Oh, thank God, a reason for this game to exist. Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe. Now, it was definitely a very busy year for the franchise, but to be fair, this was all in the name of Kirby's 30th anniversary. And what better way to cap off the festivities than with 
with a remaster of some random ass Wii game. Return to Dreamland is pretty good, but it's also pretty damn typical. It's like, picture a Kirby game. But what the hell is wrong with you? Well, Return to Dreamland is pretty much the go-to example of a baseline Kirby experience. Uh, much like how new Super Mario Bros. U is that for 2D Mario, uh, but that comparison does a disservice to the quality of Return to Dreamland. Uh, when I say it's pretty good, I, I mean it. Like, this isn't my favorite Kirby game. It was definitely eclipsed by the games that followed, but this was the start of modern 2D Kirby. If any game had a reason to be basic, it's this one. Though that does muddy its legacy a bit. It makes it somewhat forgettable while also making me question the point of this remaster. Then I realized this means we'd actually get a good 2D Kirby on Switch. You know, it's weird. Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe may be one of the highest quality remasters out there. Hell, I think it might be considered a remake, and it's like, you didn't need to go this far. This is the kind of game that ages very well. Uh, just upgrade the resolution, and honestly, you're golden. But check this out, they recreated everything. The backgrounds have so much more detail now. There's no element that's a little low res, like, oh, that's from the Wii game. No, this straight up looks like a brand new title. And the new art style definitely helps with that. Very interesting choice to give the characters big, bold outlines, but I think it looks great. While the original didn't have a problem with the visibility, well, it's still better here and helps give Return to Dreamland a bit of its own style. Everything pops that much more because of it. I think it was an unnecessary yet fantastic change. This game's visuals are just so much fun to look at. But that's where this game differs the most from the original. Make no mistake, this is basically the exact same thing as before. The game plays identically, which isn't a bad thing. Return to Dreamland was always very easy and simple, but never mindless. The level design, while nothing jaw-dropping, is very smart. It's greatly balanced to be accessible for newcomers, yet engaging for veterans, which is more than I can say about Kirby's star allies, see? But we haven't even mentioned the addition of Merry Magoland, which contains so many fully remade minigames from throughout the series history. The Magalore epilogue, the brand new copy abilities included, which are just kinda here to fill out the back of the box, but still! Return to Dreamland Deluxe took a game I found to be solid yet pretty run-of-the-mill and forgettable and turned it into honestly one of the best Kirby games. It's so polished, featuring a good campaign with loads of extra new activities surrounding it. It's genuinely Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe! Oh, that's why it's called that! Now, when it comes to third parties, Square Enix had a damn busy month here with Octopath Traveler 2, Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line, and Life is Strange 2. Uh, you see, and with that, all of the Life is Strange games announced for Nintendo Switch two years ago are finally available. When did I stop caring? Before they were announced for Nintendo Switch. Now, Octopath Traveler 2 was their big release. Could you tell by the marketing? Didn't see as many people discussing this one. I think what made Octopath 1 stand out was the fact it stood out. So after years of classic RPGs, especially with this art style, I can understand why Octopath 2 struggled a bit out the gate. Plus, this one wasn't published by Nintendo like the other HD 2D games. Now, this one launched on PlayStation and PC day and day, and it still sold less than Octopath 1. And it's a shame, because from what I've played, it's much better than the original, far more engaging. But if I want to be as engaged as possible with a game this month, there's only one Square Enix game for me. Theater Rhythm Final Bar Line. God damn! Basically, a Final Fantasy rhythm game. Started on the 3DS, with this release being fundamentally the furthest possible you could take this concept at the moment. Nearly 400 tracks, not including the DLC, bringing the total to over 500. It's easy to see why the developers think this is the last in the series, and not because they don't want to make more. Rather, what the hell else are you gonna do? Follow Rock Band? As somebody who isn't a die-hard Final Fantasy nut, you may expect me not to be the world's biggest fan of Theta Rhythm. That's right, I'm third biggest. Absolutely incredible game here. It's so much fun to play through each and every song. The controls make it feel like you're conducting an orchestra. And while many may prefer the touchscreen, I really love using the buttons. It's just so satisfying to flick the sticks at the right time. All to some of the greatest music in all of gaming. This is an incredible release. Well, then what does that make this? Oh, 
9. Tales of Symphonia Remastered, probably the worst release the game has ever seen. It runs like piss and barely changes or adds anything of worth. Do you want this? Sure, after I finish my daily routine. I hate you. Now, there was far more to this month, but before we get to that, we gotta go over the Nintendo Direct streamed on February 8th, kicking things off with the big gameplay reveal trailer for Pikmin 4. You know, with this game first being talked about so soon after Pikmin 3's release, I assumed it was going to be Pikmin 3 2. And 10 years later, thank God it wasn't. You can clearly see where that time went, as Pikmin 4 is filled with new ideas. I mean, Ice Pikmin? Night Exploration? A whole ass dog? None of this half dog sh. Oh, it just looked so good! Exactly what Pikmin 4 needed to be, especially after all these years. And with the release date of July 21st locked in, well, we wouldn't have to wait much longer. It seems like we have a pretty damn good direct on our hands. I mean, this sandwich looks unbelievable. I can't wait to dig into the middle. The core of this direct was pretty weak, honestly. I mean, Samba de Amigo Party Central, Ghost Trick, Deca Police, We Love Katamari Reroll, all cool games, but it's all bogged down by just a bunch of nothing announcements. What, the Splatoon 3 DLC is the hub from the first game? This is like one of the lamest pieces of paid DLC Nintendo's ever announced. Tron Identity is just a damn visual novel. Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 gets a finalized release date after a whole year. Uh, like, all of this is fine, but nothing to really sink your teeth into. And then, it happened. A seventh version of Pac-Man, mother Game Boy Games on Nintendo Switch Online, plus Game Boy Advance on Nintendo Switch Online plus Expansion Pack. Well, let's pause the Nintendo Direct and dive into these because both launched that exact day. When it originally launched in 2018, Nintendo Switch Online was a joke. I mean, piss poor online multiplayer performance and they thought a few random ass NES games would make it worth $20 a year? Technically, yes, it wasn't the worst deal. All these games were $5 a pop on previous systems, but I wasn't happy about it. However, while it's been a slow process, all of the game additions throughout the years, Super Nintendo titles, plus the actual improvements Nintendo has made to their online multiplayer quality has turned things around significantly. I mean, you get nearly 200 retro games for 20 bones a year, and many of them are some of the all-time greats? You can't beat that. Supposedly you can, but I have absolutely no problem spending that amount considering what I get. Though after a while, I have to admit, it was getting awful quiet around here without something to bitch about. Oh, thank God. Nintendo Switch Online plus Expansion Pack. For $50 a year, we got N64, Sega Genesis, and access to certain DLC for some games. And for over twice the price of the base tier, it was worth it. However, once again, over time, with more and more games being added and benefits included, I'd say the expansion pack was barely worth it. I don't think the Sega Genesis games add much value at all. The DLC depends on if you own their respective games, and N64 doesn't have the deepest library, so it's not like they can keep updating this lineup like they could with NES or SNES. <laughs> and even then, additions to those systems have been undeniably sparse since the introduction of the expansion pack. So the introduction of Game Boy and Game Boy Advance turns Nintendo Switch Online into honestly one of the best gaming subscription service deals out there. Though, gotta be honest, the expansion pack still feels odd. I mean, GBA is sweet, but making that $50 a year while SNES is 20, when so much of the Game Boy Advance library is worth 40 at most. Nah, I mean, it's a similar situation with the Genesis being here as well. Like, is this really more valuable than SNES in the base tier? That 20 a year is taking you damn far, especially with Game Boy's inclusion. At launch, we got nine original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, and yeah, Nintendo considers these to be the same system. It's why they're not invited to Thanksgiving this year. Really cool to see the original Tetris and randomly alone in the dark, the new nightmare. I've said it before, before, but even if Game Boy games don't age as well, I find trying them out way more interesting than NES or SNES games just because these haven't been re-released as much. They're such cool little novelties that hold up better than you may think sometimes. The lineup here includes some of the best the handheld had to offer. Mario Land 2, Kirby's Dream Land, Game & Watch Gallery 3, Wario Land 3, Metroid 2, Gargoyles Quest, Link's Awakening DX. And the emulation quality is sublime. These games look and play great. 
The Game Boy Color is far less saturated than I'm used to. I honestly thought when they showed off Link's Awakening, it was the original Game Boy version played in a Game Boy Color, which would give it an expanded yet limited color palette. Uh, not the DX version, which was just full-blown color. Uh, that's because they were truly trying to emulate how these games would look on the original Game Boy Color, which I respect, though I'd be lying if I said I didn't prefer the more saturated look these games had on the Game Boy Advance or 3DS Virtual Console. Uh, but that might just be because it's what I'm used to these games looking like. And hey, at least for the original Game Boy games, we have a few different filters to use, simulating the different console screens. Uh, they could have gone further with this. Uh, how about the Super Game Boy, Game Boy Light, Game Boy Advance, or no, even just pure black and white? That's not a huge deal though. The online multiplayer feature alone makes this the definitive official way to play these games. I mean, just taking a step back and thinking how we're able to play Game Boy Tetris Online is so damn novel. Though that functionality is so much more useful on Game Boy Advance. I mean, oh my god, Mario Kart Super Circuit Online? Oh my god, Mario Kart Super Circuit Online? Yeah, this ain't gonna be taking over Mario Kart 8 anytime soon, but it's pretty crazy to have this option available alongside a slew of classic GBA games. And not as many as Game Boy, only six at launch, which is kinda tart considering access to these is considerably more expensive, but these are all high, high, high quality titles. The Mario and Luigi, the Minish Cap, WarioWare, Kuro Kuro Kuroin, Mario Advance 4, Mario Kart, uh, these are all a dream to have on Switch. The problem was it was a dream so long it turned into a coma. But I am so happy these are finally available on this platform and even happier that Nintendo has been going above and beyond. I mean, they're adding Kirby Tilt and Tumble, actually using the gyroscope in the controller. That is so cool and something they never would have done on previous consoles. They would have just not re-released that one. And hey, there is a rumor that Nintendo would enable transfer pack support with the Nintendo 64 on NSO. And lo and behold, they re-uploaded a promotional video with a disclaimer removed that transfer pack functionality wouldn't work. That could mean the original Pokemon games would come over. You could transfer them into Pokemon Stadium or trade over the internet. The possibilities are endless because Nintendo actually started to do cool sh** with their old games. What? Yep, immediately after the Game Boy announcement, Metroid Prime Remastered was revealed and released digitally with a physical release on February 22nd. I just had to download it right then and there and didn't get to actually playing it until late February after I bought the physical copy. But it's completely fine. See, I thought this through. So I already owned Metroid Prime for GameCube, then the Wii re-release, then Remastered Digital, and by the time I got Remastered Physical, oh. Metroid Prime Remastered was rumored about for years, if you want to count the reports of the whole Prime trilogy coming around 2018. Though, while that was supposedly a pretty basic HD remaster, this right here is the whole kit and caboodle. My lord! These environments look unbelievable, like something you'd see on any of the modern consoles. The reflections, the textures, the lighting, nothing looks left over from the GameCube original. It all looks like a new ass game. And Metroid Prime itself holds up so well, man. Uh, now, I am a little concerned at the lack of Metroid Prime 4 info with this release, but I do think Prime Remastered is more of a sign of things to come then it's not. Honestly, one of the greatest remasters I've ever played. Uh, when this was rumored, the idea of just doing the first game instead of all of them was a bit deflating, but now I can see why they did Prime 1 by itself, because the work they did on it deserved the spotlight. After that bombshell, we got another GameCube HD remaster announced, Bot and Kaido's 1 and 2, originally developed by Monolith Soft of Xenoblade fame. This looked pretty underwhelming. I mean, there was no English voice acting, which I think automatically brings us a step below the originals, which had that. And putting a more budget, quick and dirty remaster like this after Metroid Prime did it no favors. Uh, the return of Fantasy Life and Professor Layton followed, which were definitely cool to see. Uh, look at the next wave of the booster course pass, including a new course and new character, those lying bastards. And we ended things with another trailer for The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, which once again barely showed anything of worth. I mean, it's a fine trailer, definitely meatier than anything we've gotten up to this point, and it did show off some new stuff like these vehicles, but that's all I really retained from this, these two shots. And I just thought, 
well, that's cool. I mean, it may not be worth ending a Nintendo Direct on, but I'd maybe pay like 10 extra dollars for it. Oh, this is great. Yep, Tears of the Kingdom popped up on the eShop afterwards with a price tag of $69.99. What many PS5 and Xbox Series games were going for and one of the first Nintendo Switch games to make the jump. Considering the file size, they would have to use a larger cartridge than normal, so sure. You don't get that excuse. Overall, the Nintendo Direct had some pretty high highs, but wasn't one of the greatest. If it wasn't for the Game Boy games and Metroid Prime, what was really there? Not Disney Speedstorm again, and that threw me off. Well then, maybe the Pokemon Presents this month will deliver. Aha, Scarlet and Violet DLC when the game still has significant problems that haven't been fixed. Exactly what I, a Nintendo fan, wants. More bullshit. Which is what this year of the Nintendo Switch felt like. It was very much a ho-hum period for the system. And some solid releases, though nothing console-defining. Though, unfortunately, we also got some of the most infamous titles the Switch had ever seen. Uh, very controversial games to discuss, which made me question my faithfulness as a fan. In my own funny little made-up language, that means yum yum yum, time to bitch. You can definitely tell we're slowly easing out of the Switch generation at this point. Uh, even if what came after February 2023 was non-stop major releases, we're definitely nearing the end here, which is wild to think about. Doesn't feel that long ago this thing made its debut, but turns out it's one of the longest lasting Nintendo systems at this point. And rightfully so. I mean, this year was one of the Switch's lamest in my opinion, and it still had two hours of junk to talk about. The amount of content hitting this system is unprecedented. I do definitely miss the growing pains era of the system. Uh, it was also exciting, the system was so fresh. Uh, but I can't possibly undermine the Switch's success and the output of content this late into the game, especially compared to the competition. Uh, you're lucky if Sony and Microsoft put out a fraction of the amount of games Nintendo does combined. I think I'm just ready for that next thing, that's all. Uh, this thing has served us well for nearly half a decade, but I think we all need something new, and I think we're gonna get it. I never said when.